Please be seated. We are about to start right now. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very warm welcome I greet to all of you. Distinguished guests, uh, Mr. Aaron Paul, um, uh, British Commission Malaysia uh, Health Advisor, Dr. Murgaraj Rajdure, um, President of Commonwealth Medical Association, Dr. Murli Daren Munisami, um, Managing Director of um, National Cancer Society of Malaysia, and we will soon have Assistant Professor uh, Dr. Tio Chia uh, Traditional and Complementary Health Medicine um, Director of UCSI Hospital, and Ms. Mani Hafuat, CEO and Founder from Plus Wives. Um, distinguished guest and my fellow tuning and Netflix, welcome to the biggest event of the year, tuning, tuning on the Malaysia Health Hub 2023. <laughs> so as you know, um, the theme is future of health, and um, I hope what you can get from this is um, certain questions answered like. How forward is Malaysia in embracing global health challenges? And are we um, embracing all the rapid advancements in global health technology and integrated medicine, as well as some mental health aids and dis uh, disability sensitization? And I hope you just sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. So before we start, some housekeeping rules. Please keep your... Oh, I did not introduce myself, sorry. Uh, I'm Dr. Fatima Raisha, and I'm a Chimney recipient of the year 2020-2021. I did my master's in Applied Human Nutrition at Oxford Brooks, and I've been practicing in um, Ministry of Health for the past 10 years, and currently in Hospital Pajaya. So, uh, we'll move on to the housekeeping room, okay? Please kindly put your mobile phones on silent, and uh, toilets are located outside of this event hall. The disabled toilet, unfortunately, is only in the ground floor, but if you need any help, um, please do approach our community members, those with the blue tags. And there are no scheduled fire drills, so in case of emergency, please go back through the way you came back from. We will be there for you, no worries. Uh, and we will be taking photographs and videos for our social media, so if you have any problem and not consent to be published, do approach our community members as well. And finally, we are on social media. Follow us at Chimney Mind and um, do tag us at CAMHH23 hashtag um, for all this um, event coverage. Okay, without further ado, I would like to call upon our ever cheerful and pleasant president, Ms. Nawar Shukri, uh, Chimney Alumni President, um, Malaysia, for um, a welcoming remark. Thank you. Dr. Margaraj, President of the Commonwealth Medical Association as well, and uh, immediate past president of the Malaysian Medical Association. Distinguished panelists, chief alumni, and friends. Thank you all for joining us on a Saturday morning, no less, uh, for CHAM Health Health, CHAM's inaugural health networking event. On behalf of chief alumni Malaysia, we are very pleased to be hosting you today alongside our partners, uh, the British Council of Malaysia, uh, as well as work co-working space. For those in the room who may be unfamiliar, Chimney Alumni Malaysia, or CAN, as we call ourselves, uh, is the alumni association representing Malaysian recipients of the UK Foreign Commonwealth Development Office's Chimney Sanction. We call it the UK FCDO. Um, it was established about 40 years ago, not about, 40 years ago. Today, uh, this year is Chimney's 40th anniversary. And Malaysians have been uh, beneficiaries pretty much from the start of uh, the scholarship. It's a postgraduate scholarship for emerging leaders around the world across various fields. Um, and 
Malaysia was one of the first rambo to formalize its uh, own alumni association. So Cam is actually 25 years old this year. <laughs> and I'd say today's event uh, exemplifies the values with which Cam was formed in 1998. It's a blend of knowledge sharing and community building among a diverse group of people. And I, I trust that not everybody in the room here is a doctor or even a healthcare professional. I myself am not from the healthcare field, but uh, in, uh, we all share an aim of collaborating towards a better future. And as we have obviously learned in the last three years, um, health, uh, the future of health relies on a multi-dimensional, multi-disciplinary effort from all of us. So, uh, which brings us here today. So this uh, multi-dimensional multi aspect is even further reinforced by the fact that, that this event was driven not by the company, the committee itself, but actually by alumni themselves, who are passionate about the future of health. Alana Lian Roy came to us not five months ago with a mission to bring together the health tech community with the support of the Camp Health Hub, Health Hub Organizing Committee. Today is the, the culmination of that, of that aim. I, for one, am very excited to hear from our lineup of speakers, including a series of info sessions from experts who make it their mission to build a more inclusive and accessible future. So, I won't hold us from that much longer. Uh, Thank you all for, for joining us on, on this Saturday morning. I hope you have an enriching day and take advantage of the uh, wealth of knowledge and, and um, health community members around you today. And um, I hope you have a wonderful uh, morning. Thank you. Thank you, Noah, for the energetic welcome. And I would like to next call upon um, Mr. Azkar our achievement organizing um, committee as well um, for Q events. Hi, good morning everybody. How are you today? Good. 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 Thank you very much, Thank you very much uh, uh, for attending uh, and uh, racing our inaugural Camp Health Hub event today. Uh, this event uh, won't happen uh, uh, if not for the support of uh, our community partners, especially British Council, we have a representative here, uh, Ms. Marisa, thank you very much. Under the uh, Alumni UK Challenge Fund, uh, which I won uh, back in February, and uh, through the uh, Challenge Fund, we, we organized this kind of uh, health networking. And I uh, also want to uh, say uh, a big thank you to Work, our community partner, um, the event space that uh, you're seeing today. So without further ado, I just uh, share a quick uh, video of what alumni UK is all about and what uh, work can to support the community. Go ahead, uh, get the video. Thanks. So sorry. Did you study in the UK and want access to an exclusive global community? The British Council is building the biggest global network for all international UK alumni. Alumni UK. to Alumni UK is fast, simple, and free. See how Alumni UK can help you to change your future today. Uh, if you are an Alumni UK and you haven't received your label pin, please find me after the event or something and make sure that you can get one. 
que tengo a Mateo Bus, aquí yo. What's a place where you become more effective and productive in your work? All the touch points are here for you to become a better worker to become where you are. It's an open, inclusive community of people that come together to learn from each other and collaborate and transact. How we achieve this is to foster a very open, diverse community and break down people's barriers. in public health and humanitarian roles in the United States and in Malaysia. Some of his notable achievements would be um, delivering health initiative for the community in Kuala Lumpur on non-communicable disease intervention under the UK Better Health Program Fund, and uh, COVID-19 vaccine projects such as the ASEAN Vaccine Development and Manufacturing Project. Aaron holds a Master's in Business Administration from the University of Nottingham and is a Fellow of the Royal Society for Public Health. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mr. Aaron Fox. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Salas uh, Jatra and a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, it's a great honor for me to uh, welcome you today to this inaugural health networking event with the theme, The Future of Health, hosted by the Shifting Alumni Malaysia uh, Health. Uh, I believe Nawar has already talked a little bit about what Shifting Alumni uh, Shifting is, so I think I wouldn't uh, elaborate more on that. Uh, and also the fact that it's already celebrating its 40th uh, anniversary this year. But did you know that, um, and I think my colleague here will tell me if I don't say this, uh, did you know that the deadline for uh, next year's application cycle is next Tuesday, so the 7th of November. So if you, uh, I'm not sure if you, uh, or your friends, um, plan to uh, send in an application, uh, so in the next couple of days. Uh, but, you know, I'll plug for uh, this uh, shipping uh, program. Uh, I speak to you today in some capacity as the uh, as a representative of the High Commission, but more as a fellow advocate uh, for the uh, wider overall health um, and well-being of all people regardless of what it is, and to envision what the future of health is going to look like. I believe today we'll be hearing from um, some thought leaders on paradigm shift 
in, um, in the way we uh, practice health. I think it's a very pertinent um, topic these days for Malaysia, given all the, given all the thoughts on health reforms uh, these days. But also on how we think about uh, Malaysia, uh, about health, especially in terms of inclusivity. Physical, mental, and social, and I think that falls roughly into what World Health Organization's definition of health, encompassing uh, physical, mental, and social. So, ladies and gentlemen, the UK and Malaysia have a long shared history. And so, um, I think in this time of global challenge and um, change, I think it is increasingly vital. That nations collaborate and learn from one another. The future of healthcare, whether it's in the in, in the UK or uh, sorry, the future of healthcare, whether in, in the UK or Malaysia, is marked by both common challenges and shared opportunities. So allow me to, if I may, if you may, um, provide some reflections on what these areas might be. Firstly, of course, on education and training. Um, the World Health Organization projects a shortfall of 10 million health workers by 2030. So, there's chronic underinvestment in education and training of health workers. And, but there's also the mismatch between education and employment. So, these have contributed to uh, the continuous short shortages uh, around, around the world. The UK takes pride in its uh, world-class education and training programs, and I'm sure a lot of you here have benefited in one way or another from a UK, uh, the UK program. Uh, but after education comes employment. So some countries have faced a paradox of health worker unemployment despite the growing unmet health needs. This is particularly troubling because two thirds of health workforce are women. But it also means that investment in health workforce is an opportunity for decent employment uh, for women and youth. And that will shape the, our, our future uh, health care. Next on global health initiatives. I mean, Countries like the UK and Malaysia can jointly address global health challenges, for example, uh, emerging uh, infectious diseases and climate related health risks, as we've seen in the past couple of years. Uh, just yesterday, the UK announced the new UK ASEAN Global Health Security Program, which will support ASEAN's strengthening capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to health threats in Southeast Asia. So this contributes to our improved uh, regional and global health security. With that comes research and development. We know that collaborative research initiatives can lead to breakthroughs in areas like genomics, drug discovery, and um, disease prevention. Uh, through the High Commission, the UK and Malaysia Cooperation on Science was initiated over 15 years ago. But uh, collaboration between UK and Malaysian researchers have long been established way before that. Um, ASEAN will soon receive a push from the UK as the next phase of the uh, International Science Partnership Fund. It's it. I'm sure our science and innovation uh, network colleagues will, will be a good contact point for researchers and innovators who, are, who will be working towards a secure and healthy population. Since I mentioned technology and innovation, these days it's hard not to uh, be exposed to terms like artificial intelligence and chat GPT and whatnot. I think by working together, we can harness the power of artificial intelligence, uh, digital health, and you know, health medicine to make our lives better. But Technology and innovation comes at the risk. So that's why this week the UK hosted the inaugural AI Safety Summit, 
where countries are pending uh, agree to the Bletchley Declar Declaration on AI safe Safety. So this is a landmark agreement uh, recognizing a shared consensus on the opportunities and risks of AI and the need for collaborative action on frontier uh, AI safety. Ladies and gentlemen, these are just some examples of common challenges and shared opportunities. There are more, and the UK does not claim itself as the experts in everything. Uh, and I know this, I work there, but I work for them. Uh, but hopefully, this opens the door for uh, more conversations as we all envision our own future of health. Uh, before I end, my sincere appreciation goes to the organizing committee of the uh, of CAM, which is on Malaysia Help Up, uh, even partners, British Council of Malaysia at work, esteemed speakers, including Dr. Muruga, uh, Professor Dr. Murali Karan Munsami, Ms. Madiga Fuad, uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Kyo Chia Shen, who will lead on our discussion on the future of health uh, on future of health today. And of course, to all the distinguished guests and colleagues, I extend my warmest um, wishes for a productive and stimulating event. Thank you very much, Aaron. That was some company. Um, moving on for the um, most awaited session, the keynote address. It is my utmost pleasure to welcome someone with the perfect trio of degrees. He has a medical degree and is a practicing GP in Johor. He uh, has a master's in business administration and he pursued law. Um, so he did his LLB in University of London and graduated honors. So that's a deadly combination, so don't mess with him. Uh, he is the current president of the Commonwealth Medical Association and uh, immediate past president of medical, uh, Malaysian Medical Association. And he has volunteered in Ashi for the tsunami um, in 2004, and also recently for the Ukrainian war in Warsaw Poland as a uh, medical doctor. So uh, please put your hands together for our very distinguished speaker, Dr. Burgaraj Rajivan. Honor to be here today to say a few words. And, uh, topic is the future of healthcare, but I'm going to go add on to what uh, Mr. Allen said just now because future of healthcare is global today. Everywhere, everyone is competing for the same thing. We all are chasing the same thing, but there are a lot of drawbacks, a lot of challenges. So I'm going to touch a little bit on all that and the drawbacks as well. Okay. We first must accept that the, the landscape is going to change. Older doctors, even me, maybe about 10 years ago or 8 years ago, if you came and told me that you do an ECG and the ECG will tell you whether you, you know if, what, what's your heart doing, how's your heart doing, I'm going to say no, I don't trust the machine, I don't want. Or if you come and told me that no, my, my, I'm wearing a watch and my watch stays, is my pulse rate, I said sorry, I don't accept. Now, well, because at that time it was not reliable, so we did not accept. Okay, so everything will change. The way you deliver, it will be precision medicine, pharmacogenetics, genetics. All your you know, clinics will change. All the ways hospitals also will change. The way you keep medical records will change. Like it or not, first we have to accept that there is going to be a change. Okay, what we have to look out for. Okay, data. Today, data is the thing. No one is stealing any more gold and diamond. Everybody wants to steal data. Okay, everybody wants data. Everybody wants to hack other people's data because data is the new goal. And without data, you don't have AI. You cannot have your algorithms for AI. Okay, and next thing is your 
For in healthcare, your patients will be the one, your empowered consumers. And uh, behavior change, like telemedicine, home comfort. Today, if I, I mean, about seven, eight years ago, if there's one old uncle who needs to monitor his blood pressure, every day they have to put him in the wheelchair, come look for car park, come to my clinic, check the blood pressure, and go back. But today, he will be at home, and I can see him through telemedicine, and he will be telling me, today is my BP, is this, and also everything changes. And scientific innovations, you know, competition there, because uh, as the president of Commonwealth and Association, I get calls from like Nigeria, from UK, from Malta, everybody is coming up with, I've got this telemedicine app, I've got this, but every time I hear, there's improvement. There's something, uh, you know, they've enhanced the features of the, of that, so there's competition in that. Okay, what are you going to look for in the next decade? The trend will be there's more patients, there will be more technology, more information, more data. You know? Okay, this I ran through the stuff. Okay. Smart healthcare, of course, we talk about hospital first. Even in, in KL today, you got uh, something, uh, I'm not promoting any hospitals, but you know, Sunway has won twice the uh, uh, Smart Healthcare Hospital uh, Award. And then uh, there's one more hospital, Park City or something, they are also going into uh, smart wards. And then uh, you've got Care Wellness City, you know, this is something that I'm really uh, interested in because they have made one big uh, development where you have your smart hospital, you have your hospital schools, you have your physiotherapy, you have your retirement home. So you sit down there and you can do telemedicine consultation with your boss. With your doctor, and if you want your, your nurse, your nurse is there, they, they will come up so you don't have to move. So, uh, and of course, individually, you, you wear smart wearables, you know, which actually the smart wearable that we didn't accept earlier today, everything is there. You know, it continuously monitors your, your heart health parameters and keeping personal medical records. Okay, this is something I'll share later when I talk about tele, uh, about uh, for public private partnership. But, okay, I mean, these are all the things that you can monitor yourself. I mean, all this on that side, you, you would have had to come to the clinic or hospital to check just a few years ago. But today, you can do everything yourself. And now you've got something, you know, for the future. One ring for all, you just many. You know, you wear this ring, you go and sleep. It's called ring cord. It's a smart ring. And, uh, it can give you continuous monitoring of all these your health parameters, your sleep pattern. I think the doctor, if there's any doctors here, you all will know that to do a sleep study, you have to be admitted in the hospital before, or the technician will come to your house and put some wires on you, some gadget, and ask you to sleep. And next day they come and go and meet the, the sleep pattern. Then they, they might call you in the evening and say, while sleeping, I think your wire came off. And I cannot get your sleep pattern, but today no such thing. One day, however rough you sleep, also you're going to get your sleep pattern the next day. Okay, and um, so a smart hospital actually connects people, data, technology in intelligent ways for better care experience and seamless transition across care settings from hospital to home. That means from the time you get admitted to your home to your follow-ups. Okay. And uh, all this, uh, I won't go through because it's given me about 20 25 minutes, but it's a lot of slides, so I'm just going to go through fast, okay? This is what I said just now. Smart variables were rejected by most medical doctors before, but today, smart variables have gained considerable attention from information system academics, business managers, and health practitioners. Accepted, reliable. You know, there's a lot of research into smart variables. I'm sure we also used about, about seven, eight years ago. You know, so you only can see your first the watch is only you can see your time. Then you can see your heart rate. You know, then after that, you can see your saturation. And now, so many things you can see your temperature, everything there. So, again, what is this? This is something that was forced upon us. 
Okay? We didn't want to share. We didn't want to give our data. You know, we, we, and when, when this first came out, we said, no, I'm not giving my data. I don't want my data. They will hang my data and all that. But today, my data is doing a lot. In fact, I'm in the new, uh, new, uh, new local uh, vaccination team, and we were thinking how to uh, uh, motivate people to take come and take their vaccination and then we thought about my sajantra because even a baby you know under a dependent uh, is in the, has a my sajantra so everybody has a my sajantra in one of them and so it, it, it was enhanced uh, as, it go, as, it, as it went along same thing for duty this thing uh, in Indonesia and Sri Lanka's uh, vaccination as a commonwealth president I need to touch a little bit of my commonwealth country but you know Sri Lanka was a country that everybody wrote off, they say financially down, uh, politically unstable, but will you believe that they were one of the first countries in the world to deploy uh, this uh, COVID-19 vaccination information management system? You know, a country that was written off. So even that country is not letting go in technology and uh, you know, wants to move forward, but they managed to do it with the Ministry of Health of Sri Lanka and the World Health Organization. Telemedicine. Are we done with telemedicine? Like I said, a lot of enhancement. There's a lot of uh, this thing. So today, first telemedicine was only between the, the GP and you know, in his patients. Then telemedicine became like, okay, nationwide. Now telemedicine is global. When like in 3 o'clock morning, I want a doctor and all my clinics are closed. I just have to look at which clinic is open in uh, US or UK and I, I need some to say I can go into telemedicine today. Okay, but telemedicine is still evolving and now you've got asynchronous telemedicine. Okay, in Australia, uh, uh, the Telehealth Society defines asynchronous telemedicine as a potential approach to acquire medical data from a patient and transfer it to a doctor or specialist to assess it offline or at a private time. Even I do that. I mean, from morning, I'm busy in my day, then uh, I don't answer my WhatsApp, I don't look at my uh, emails and all that. And when it's lunchtime or you know, uh, in the evenings, when I see, and then I answer. Okay, so they can send me things like this. They can send you a photo or they can send you, uh, send you a, a email or text message and you can answer. Of course, now because we're not using an app, so if uh, someone sends me, say, Aaron sends me a uh, WhatsApp, I'm just going to answer free. But after this, no more. I have to go to an app so the doctor can make some consultation money as well. Okay. <laughs> so, ambient intelligence and uh, another intelligence, uh, emotion AI will work together. But these are things that actually we don't realize. And it's already in Malaysia. It's globally everywhere. Whatever we're discussing about Malaysia today, uh, it's global everywhere you go. Even if you go to African countries, all these are already there. There are hospitals that they are building, there are private hospitals they are building, are all also becoming smart hospitals. They are also, when I went to Kenya recently, I see everybody wearing a uh, smartwatch and all. And so it's the same thing, but they monitor our vitals without disturbing us. You know, either with sensors, with cameras, and uh, this is. <laughs> You go to a hospital, all this is there. They can even if you move a little bit from your bed, say if they already fixed that, you only can move this much and they fixed it. If you move a little bit, the alarm will ring, saying that this guy is going to fall down. Okay, all that work is done by sensors and cameras and now medicine dispensers as well. So in the hospitals, you don't, the nurse doesn't have to come and give you the medicine anymore. Your alarm, your phone will ring and you know, let you know that your medicine dispenser is going to dispense some medicine which is inside the bed. Of course, some hours will miss the nurses coming to give us a medicine, but then this is what you pay for, you know, uh, uh, technology. Okay, smart homes with sensors are also monitoring our vitals without us knowing, you know, it doesn't, doesn't disturb us. Those days when you get admitted in a hospital, about 5 o'clock morning, even if it's a private hospital, 5 o'clock morning, the nurse will come and disturb you. I want to take your blood pressure, I want to check your sugar, I want to take your temperature, not nothing like that. And, uh, you know, 30%, there's a study that 30% of the work that the nurses do in the hospitals are actually attending to patients calling them, please close my curtain, uh, please uh, dim my light. But now they can do everything from their bed. 
So the, the nurses can actually uh, pay more attention to their work. And emotion AI. Okay, so like uh, Dr. Milo, uh, I mean he's doing psychiatry. So for that, for this, for him and other psychiatrists, this will be a very useful tool because he can recognize and interpret human emotions. You know, he can detect anxiety and depression. Of course, ambient intelligence and emotional AI are still concepts that they are working on, but some of the hospitals are already using it. Okay, this one actually I want to talk about. The rest, I think, uh, just touch a bit because the other team will be talking about it. But the drawbacks of AI in the health sector. So, the main drawback will be the data collection. Like what Mr. Alan said just now, we need data and we, we cannot only use population data. We need data from all over the world. We need laws from all over the world. You know, it cannot be like China make one law about AI and then the US makes their own law and then the European Union makes their own law. Then no system can meet each other and we cannot reach anywhere. Because what we are doing or what we are building here is global. And then of course we've got the ethical concerns. The social concern is something that we spoke about just now. Okay. Ethical concern is accountability especially in the medical field. And then, the main question here is, who is to be blamed in the event of a system failure? You cannot, you cannot blame the doctor when they have no part in developing the system. At the same time, you cannot blame the developer because he was not in the clinical setting. Okay? So these are the things that we have to go through. These are the legislations that we have to come up with. And for some time, use of artificial intelligence for ethical decision making in healthcare is prohibited in China and Hong Kong. I don't know whether they lifted it. Uh, it was there earlier. Okay. So drawbacks of we go on data collection, patients records. You know, very confidential, guys are reluctant to exchange health data. I wouldn't want to, or I, I didn't want to maybe a few years ago. But today, I know that I have to. We all have to, if you want to develop a good AI system for the future, for the, our children and our grandchildren, then we have to exchange and uh, give, give in our data. Okay, then the other drawback for data collection is data security and privacy. You know, like I said, very vulnerable, the hackers. These hackers, they only want data. They only want a record. They don't want the gold and the diamond anymore. And patient consent is a key component. So, like I said, not everybody wants to do it. So, what happened is, the key component of data privacy issue, many practitioners may allow wide usage of patient information for AI research without the patient approval. It happened in 2018. Google acquired DeepMind, a leader in healthcare uh, artificial intelligence, and the NHS had uploaded about 1.6 million patients' uh, data to DeepMind service without the patient's consent to construct its algorithm. Streams and an app for acute renal impairment. It came under severe criticism. So these things can happen because no one is sharing their data. No matter what the drawbacks, artificial intelligence, sorry. No matter what the drawbacks, artificial intelligence is going to stay. Okay. It will continue to clean up. Uh, its present part and ultimately become a mature and an effective tool for healthcare. AI will definitely stay. I mean, people are already talking about diagnostic centers purely with AI. That means I walk into a place, I don't need to see a doctor, I do my CT scan, only the doctor needs to order it. After I do my CT scan, MRI, I take my chest x ray, I get a report, and then I decide whether I need to see a surgeon or whether I'm okay. You know, so uh, diagnostic centers with AI. Uh, even in India, they are already uh, pushing for it. Okay, this is the 
this is the grey area that we are talking about and a lot of laws are coming up. The first few laws were the general computational regulation of Europe and the health research regulation. Uh, it, uh, sorry. Yeah, examples of legislation that may help resolve the problem by restricting the collection, use and sharing of personal information. So when you do this, lesser people are going to share their data and that's why the problem with data collection. You know? And however, laws passed by various countries make it difficult for collaboration and cooperative research because it's global. Malaysia will pass one law. Australia will pass one law, China will pass one law, so it becomes more and more difficult. So this will actually reduce the reduce or may restrict the quantity of data accessible to trade AI systems. The next big thing is who is at fault? Whether it's the software developer, the operator, the manufacturer, doctor. So these are all left to the lawyers to and medical legal experts to come up with. Liability for division. This is something I took from uh, Turkey. There's no special regulation that can be directly applied to both the legal and criminal liability of artificial intelligence. The doctor is the one that is considered wrong if he does not perform adequate physical examination or necessary examination. So from this you can see actually the AI is only going to be a tool to assist you for now. You cannot totally depend on that. We are not there yet. We are going, this is all our future. We are working towards it. But again, the doctor is the one that is going to be held responsible if you do not do the necessary examination. And even if the AI system makes a mistake, you should be able to recognize it. And how to go about all this is, Medical education also must change. Okay, we have to introduce because say in five years AI is going to be somewhere. And if you go join med school today, you come out in five years, but you do not study anything about AI. When you come up, you're also going to be blur like all of us when it comes to AI. So it's crucial to integrate basic AI tools, application, and terminologies in medical institute. And also, also training for the health practitioners, young doctors, specialists, uh, how to manage the uh, AI. Okay, uh, we'll go on the right later, but US has established the Food and Drug Administration to evaluate the safety and efficacy of AI system. NHS in UK is also drafting standards for showing the effectiveness of AI given, but just now Mr. Allen said something new happened to me. And, and I know that the, the EU Parliament has also uh, uh, come up with some uh, regulations for AI. I think they are one of the world's first to come up with that. And uh, Malaysia has got a bill also. But you look at this. Look at this thing here. This was taken a few days ago, New York Times where they are actually all of this started from there but they, their doctors itself are not happy to use AI yet see the FDA has, has approved many new programs that use artificial intelligence but doctors are skeptical that the tools really uh, will improve care or whether they are backed by uh, solid research so we doctors ourselves are only working towards all this technology and all this artificial intelligence, but we have not actually accepted it 100%, or we don't trust it 100% because it is not fully developed yet. The system can still make mistakes. Yes, I met someone the day in the UK, and they told me that the AI uh, can read the chest x ray with more than 99% accuracy. You know, uh, maybe I might miss and say I can only read 70-80%, so the 90%, 99% uh, accuracy is, uh, seems better. But I think, again, it should be for now, your clinical interpretation, the doctor's knowledge, and maybe the AI tool that will help you. 
So solutions for drawbacks, like I said, you have to go back to medical colleges, train them from now, so that when they come out in five years, they uh, you know they can keep up with the AI then. And for ethical issues, you need fairness, accountability, and transparency through implementation of ethical governance and modern interpretation of ethical auditing. Global data sharing with consent, which is going to be difficult, but it's a must if you really want that algorithm for artificial intelligence. This just going to be about CMA, I mean, because we all say Commonwealth, and then you might not know what we do, but you know, the CMA enhances the national medical as well of all the member countries. We look into how we can help poorer countries within the Commonwealth, so we do some work, say, we if we need to do some vaccination in Kenya or Nigeria, then the Commonwealth Secretary will help us. And uh, in UK, our office is actually in Margo House, UK. And then we meet and discuss in the Commonwealth Health Minister's meeting in Chogam, and where we actually give them uh, our, our papers and our ideas so that they present. We give it to them in the Health Minister's meeting and then we present it in Chogam. And then the next Commonwealth Health Digitalization Conference again is in Sri Lanka. And this is my boss, head of Commonwealth. And I was invited to Buckingham Palace to, to on the Commonwealth Day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Morgan. That was some really um, opening. Um, I think eye-opening um, points on AI and future of healthcare. I think both Mr. Aaron and uh, Dr. Murga actually is trying to tell us the future of healthcare is AI and it is here to stay. And I think more collaboration with um, different countries uh, like the UK and learning from each other will actually help us to propagate Malaysia's um, future of healthcare. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have reached to the core of our event, and um, I'm sure you guys are waiting for this panel session. Yes? Yes? Okay, wonderful. So, uh, for this session, uh, we have very prominent speakers who are leaders in their own um, field. And this will be moderated by Dr. Jinsky Chan, and he will introduce the speakers later on. Dr. Jinsky is the medical director of Ansana Health, um, which delivers a patient-centric digital primary healthcare system in Malaysia and Southeast Asia. He ventured into digital healthcare services after four years of clinical practice, and he holds an MSc in the public health with a specialized team in health economics, and is a global future fellow in the theme of predictive healthcare. He's also an author for the media, such as the Star, FMT, and Code Group. So we definitely have the right person to moderate this session. So please welcome Dr. Jin Si Chan. Thank you, Arisha. So a uh, very good morning to all of you. Um, I'm speaking to uh, Eric. Uh, it's very good for his presence uh, with the British uh, from the British High Commission. Dr. Muga has been uh, a great support to our work in Asana and each uh, doctor's believer and presentation. All our uh, distinguished uh, guests, my colleagues and friends today, are uh, a very warm uh, welcome to all of you here and I'm glad uh, that I'm able to moderate the session uh, for, for you. Now, um, I have been tasked uh, to moderate this session and I'm, I feel very humble uh, on this great topic which is the future of health. Out is big, future is bigger, but what's even bigger is the list of panelists that we have today. Um, and before we um, invite them, uh, uh, I'd love to read their bio to you so you know who you're listening to today. Starting uh, alphabetically, Ms. Maria Fuad is a renowned speaker and entrepreneur. She was recently awarded Women of the Future Global 50 Rising Stars at ESG 2022 for her impactful initiatives in health tech. As the founder and CEO of Plus Wives Group, she conducts workshops for corporate companies, universities, and the public. Her board is on human resource, corporate culture, digital healthcare, entrepreneurship, and women empowerment. 
appearances in mainstream media and conferences have enabled her to not only create awareness on issues of public interest, but also inspire individuals to embark on a self-development journey. Moving on to our second panel speaker, um, Associate Professor Dr. Murayi Theran Nisami. He is a public health physician with interests in public health, health systems, and health economics. He was trained as a medical officer at the Korean State University of Russia as a Malaysian Public Service Department scholar and holds three masters Master in Community Health Sciences from uh, University of Kabaksa, Malaysia, Master in Health Policy, Planning, and Financing from the London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, and London School of Economics and Political Science as a achieving scholar, and a master in medical education from University of Malaya. Dr. Muritaran also holds a PhD in public health uh, from the Tula Longkorn University. So before medicine, Dr. Muritaran was, uh, was an award-winning journalist for the New Straits Times. He has over 10 years of career in healthcare, including clinical medicine in public and private sectors, research and pharmaceutical. Uh, he also works closely with NGOs and academia, and having recently been appointed as an adjunct associate professor at Sunbury University. Dr. Moritari is currently the Managing Director of the uh, National Cancer Society of Indonesia. Finally, um, Assistant Professor Dr. Kyo Xia Xian is a prominent figure in integrative medicine, holding the positions of Medical Director at a traditional and complementary medicine center in UCSR Hospital and the head of PCM, PCM School at UCSR University. His expertise lies in PCM oncology, backed by a master's degree from Beijing University of Chinese Medicine. As a dedicated uh, medical doctor, he excels in clinical, research, and educational pursuits. Previously, he held key roles in TCM Division MOH and Institute Cancer Negara. Dr. Tio is, is the Vice President of the Malaysian Chinese Medical Association and a Council Member of the Specialty Committee of Integrative Oncology and Hematology of the World Federation of Chinese Medicine Societies. Actively engaged in collaborative research, he contributed to the Malaysian TCM Practice Guideline of Acupuncture and Herbal Therapy. In 2023, he received recognition as one of the 10 outstanding young Malaysians, highlighting his significant contributions to the field. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give our best to welcome our uh, esteemed panelists of state. Sure, that's only a fragment of their true track record over the years. So I think uh, each of them has spent 20 years of uh, working experience in combination with the older than many of us here today. So um, may I now invite our speakers to first uh, start with the background of what they do in their day to day and what challenges they, uh, they face in their field uh, in Malaysia. So let's start uh, on the most left, uh, the Petio, uh, over to you. Thank you. So, uh, very good morning to our distinguished uh, speakers, uh, our delegates, uh, Mr. Aaron, Dr. Munda, uh, and, and all of you. So, uh, I'm Kyo, and uh, I'm a medical doctor specializing in integrative oncology. Uh, as mentioned just now, I was training the uh, Beijing under the China Government Scholarship. It is a Master of Integrative Medicine. So what I do there is I learn how to integrate the traditional Chinese medicine into the modern medicine camp, specifically the cancer camp. So after I graduated, I was positioned in the ENCM division MOH. So I was the principal assistant director where I get involved in this uh, policy and development for setting the uh, 15 ENCM unit all over Malaysia, uh, monitoring the uh, operations. And after that, I was in the institute as liberalized, head of the NCM unit, where I see patients and then conduct this education and also research in this field. So, for the challenges we face in this uh, integrative medicine, when we talk about integrative medicine in Malaysia, based the integration of uh, modern medicine with traditional and complementary medicine. So, this uh, ENCM is not traditional Chinese medicine, it's traditional and complementary medicine. So, uh, there are a few challenges we face. First is the governance of the practice itself, meaning that 
how to govern the traditional and complementary medicine in Malaysia. Because we need a governance, we need regulation and standards uh, for the safety, quality, and efficacy of medicine. This is, uh, this is advocated by the WHO. Safety, quality, and efficacy. So we need a governance. And then secondly, it is the integration. How do we integrate the traditional and complementary medicine, which is have totally different approach with modern medicine into the current national healthcare system? So this is the second uh, challenges, and the third one uh, will be this uh, public perception. Because you know that when people talk about traditional medicine, they first think that oh, it is a medicine uh, practiced by the inheritance of the experience and others, but then. Uh, for the past 50 years, US, uh, UK, China have been conducting research on traditional medicine in different fields. Then we even have this uh, specialty in uh, different uh, further TCM oncology, traditional Chinese medicine oncology, 30 years of experience in research analysis. So these are the things that most of the healthcare professionals they don't know. Uh, so there is a gap between between. So I think uh, that's all common. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Ms. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you very much. I'm absolutely honored to be among distinguished members of CAF, um, Mr. Aaron of Muruga. Um, my name is Mehdi Hakwai, the founder and CEO of Plus Vibes. Now, as the name goes, Plus Vibes is all about. Yes, I heard that, mental health, yes, but it's all about positive vibes. So that's how we destigmatize the whole mental health industry. Because in any country, it's all about stigma. It's all about being expensive, not accessible. Um, so how I first initially started, um, I know there's a lot of medical doctors here, and I wish I knew some of you. Um, I suffered an accident in 2019. Now that accident, uh, led me to be semi-paralyzed -paral um, because it affected my long thoracic nerve. Um, now, what happened then was that, you know, it was my first time facing any situation that related to mental health. Panic attacks, anxiety attacks, um, the depression, because I couldn't move. Um, my father was a diplomat, so I had no support system in Malaysia, so he was overseas. Um, at that time, I came back. To Malaysia, um, I was working, I was the ed, a, a, a reporter at the edge at that time. Um, so that time, I think it was it was a shock for me. And I started my own entrepreneurship at that time. Um, I did a food truck, I did a lot of different things, and upon facing that accident was when it triggered to me that mental health is important, that services are not accessible, and it's so expensive. 250 ringgit an hour. Oh, I couldn't afford it, especially for one year. And you can imagine if someone goes through that, how can they afford it and get better, right? The first, it's expensive. The second, you have to physically go to the to the mental clinic, of which if you can't go physically, how do you get that kind of support? And last but not least, it was the stigma. You know, mentally ill, there's something wrong with you, all that kind of thing. So Plus Vibes was brought about with a team of psychologists, and we partnered with a lot of universities, um, and it was all about destigmatizing mental health and making it accessible. And accessibility in this sense was to pull in all the resources from every single state and put it on a platform. So in that way, certain states like Penang, so we do a partnership with NGOs in Penang, they have numerous number of counselors, psychologists, clinical psychologists, we pull it. The Sarawak, Sarawak has lack of counselors, and that's where we can create that accessibility. Um, Alhamdulillah, three years down the road, we supported 40,000 users. We cared for 900 suicidal individuals, um, of which they go through a program of maybe as short as one or two months, six months, or even a year, and some of them are still with us because they go through specific trauma um, conditions. So that's part of our social impact. Um, how sustainable in that sense, because in any company you have to be sustainable. It's about the B2B, it's about corporates, it's about supporting employee wellness. Um, one of the challenges, I think the question was, one of the challenges was that previously, I would say corporates would allocate X amount for EAP, right? And this was just to 
I wouldn't, it was just a checklist that, okay, we do provide this, we do provide this and this. Yes, mental health care, yes, physical health care, we do provide all these accessibility, gym memberships, all these kind of things. But EAP today is more than that. EAP today might cost them slightly more because there is more problems. Like, for example, we, we support this MNC, a bank. Um, in Southeast Asia, they have different branches. Little do they know that they have suicidal individuals. And these suicidal individuals don't only um, affect themselves, but they affect everyone around. When you're wondering, why is somebody so angry suddenly and, you know, creating that whole toxic environment? There's probably something going wrong. And one example would be perhaps their son is suicidal and they don't know how to cope with it. Perhaps they go into a marriage. You can see the increasing divorce rate issues. So there are so many personal and external factors that affect employee wellness. Um, so that's the crux of it. So we focus on a social entrepreneurship side, a side where um, the public can get access to free chat therapy. And how we do that is through our volunteer system. We upskill graduates, all these kind of things. And then we have the B2B. So I'll come like down the road. Um, yeah, let's close five now. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Murali. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, of course, uh, please allow me to acknowledge uh, my boss uh, <laughs> in the Medical Association and our mentor, uh, Dr. Muruga. Pleasure, Mr. Aaron, Dr. Aisha, who have worked before. Dr. Theo, who we've known for years, and Dr. James Pisa, my colleague from Minor, and of course, Nawa, for, for really putting together the event. Uh, I would say it's national service as we can. So, always a pleasure to be able to uh, uh, come and speak for the fraternity to uh, future humans, hopefully. Uh, many of you, I hope, are in this audience. So, um, my, my, my KPI, um, uh, as, as uh, uh, similar to what uh, these two wonderful people have been talking about, is actually uh, very simple. My job is to make cancer everyone's business. Uh, so, uh, the problem is, and, and you, you will realize this from very, very repetitive kind of theme around what everyone's talking to this, uh, speaking from Dr. Muruga, I think, and what Aaron was saying as well. I think one of the, one of the things that we're waking up to is that healthcare as a space is actually very poorly, um, how to say, directed by healthcare professionals. If at most healthcare professionals have about 20% to do with healthcare. Unfortunately, um, we, we, we do kind of realize that, so we continue throwing money uh, into the healthcare space, to the formal healthcare space. But, um, and, and as you will see um, across this discussion, many of you all already work in this, for example, like Manika and, and uh, Fatios, even coming at this from a, from a medical angle, but slightly uh, on, on, a, on a broader base, right? Uh, you will find that uh, clinical medicine has uh, limitations and the problem that it's really expensive. So do, do we then, everyone, um, abandon clinical medicine? Well, that's not the way to go. But as much as we need to strengthen clinical medicine, which is expensive to do, but it's, it's good. But we, it's a lot cheaper to kind of get at everything else. And that together actually makes clinical medicine overall become a lot cheaper to deliver. Um, and I, I, as you can see, unfortunately been tainted uh, by economics. So um, half my soul is broken into uh, uh, thinking of this uh, as a money angle. But yeah, you guys know money, money makes the world go wrong. Uh, you know. Uh, so thanks to work. Uh, now, the issue is, I think, and what does the Cancer Society do? As I was telling you, we, we intend or we try our best to make cancer everyone's business. How can we, how do you do that? Schools need to work better at getting children, okay, to one, pro be protected from the impact of risk factors that will lead to cancer. Uh, they try to like eat, whether through their nutrition or their behavioral kind of uh, issues. I, I speak using the word cancer, but um, it's applicable to every other non-communicable disease as well. You know, no one picks up cancer at 40. It's not a car accident. It's really the accumulation. And, and this is true of most other non-communicable diseases, um, except those that are caused by acute injuries. Yeah. Um, for example, like COVID, long COVID, like, um, I think, uh, as Monika was saying, like post, like an RTA, then she, then she had a 
shared mental health kind of concern arising from that. But usually, it's the accumulation of a lot of bad behaviors. I mean, and, and I might still be as, as much as every, any one of you are. Uh, what is this? Uh, judging from the data, I really to say, make me know it most. Anyway, um, so, um, so, yeah, so things like working at the school level, community level, workplaces. So you spend a lot on JP, right? And then your canteens are rubbish. You know, our schools sell vape right outside the door. Worse if you went and so we all know, for example, like nuggets, sausages, uh, burgers, all these are major drivers of colorectal cancer. And um, our kids start to be exposed to this. I've got nephews who can eat processed meat at the age of two, and they have to have this every day. So by 30, of course, they're going to pick up cancer, but it's behavioral. And, I, and these are the changes we have to bring. These are the changes you have to drive through entire tea of society. People can't get jobs after a cancer diagnosis in this country. Um, you're lucky. The government is an absolutely brilliant employer that keep you on despite cancer. Everyone else get, loses their job. They can never get a job. What did they do? So it's like, it's, I mean, and I'm telling you from a social perspective, yeah, if the, basically the message you're sending to them is don't survive cancer. Because after that, we've got nothing for you to do. So these are the kind of structural changes that we all have to kind of make to enable our society to be able to do better with non traditional diseases. Overall, cancer tends to be one of those areas. So that's what we try to do every day. Thank you, please. Um, my heart feels very heavy uh, as we start with a note on the problems that we face in our country. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dio, uh, Mani Ha, and so as Dr. Burley, for describing the problems that we face really. And the reason why I bring um, what is the problem that we're facing now today, now at the start of our channel discussion, is so that we know what's been happening in the past, what's happening now, and how are we going to reach a future of health that is much better and that we can overcome all these problems. So let me recap. Dr. Kyo mentioned uh, three problems in PCM. First is a perception of the people. Second is integration into uh, the current health systems. And finally, governance of uh, PCM. Um, Madiha mentioned about problems with accessibility, with affordability, um, as well as stigma yeah, related to mental health. And finally, Dr. Murali, if I remember correctly, it's a problem of stakeholder buy-in from the schools, from the government, from the workplaces, in making cancer um, cancer survivorship equitable for everyone uh, who, who is in Malaysia. So thank you so much for describing the problem. Now, moving on uh, one step ahead. Now we describe uh, the, the, the present of health. Let's go one step further to the future of health. My question uh, to our uh, esteemed panel speakers is, do you think in the next five years, 10 years, based on the past record, uh, track record that Malaysia has, do you think uh, TCM can be fully integrated uh, into the current health system? Um, and if yes, know why? And to uh, Maniha, um, do you think uh, mental health can be as accessible as physical health uh, today um, in the next five to ten years uh, for mental health? As well, uh, finally, for uh, Dr. Murray is for cancer, uh, stakeholder buy-in, preventive, um, preventive programs and screening programs, can it be as on par as curative uh, management of cancer in the next five to ten years? So maybe we'll take uh, the other way around now. We'll start with Dr. Murray. Um, okay, thanks. Um, so I, I think one of the so I, I, I told you that prevention is cheap, um, and everybody understands this. There's like nobody in the world who doesn't echo this issue of prevention is cheap. But the problem is prevention is cheap. So what do I mean by this? Prevention is not driven by economics because there's no economic incentive to do prevention. On the other hand, so how much does eating healthy cost you? A lot, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's rubbish, right? Uh, okay, it's, really, it's, it, it is. Uh, but th this is the heart of the problem, right? Because the entire eating healthy space is driven by consumer, um, consumer, how to say, uh, companies uh, working within that space, which is a good thing. But they can get, never get up to the economies of scale to be able to deliver something cheap enough and healthy at the same time. But on the other hand, okay, you've got the golden arch. 
<laughs> so, and no, I'm kidding. Um, they, they hate me, I hate them as well. I'm sure it's a kind of hatred that didn't the fast food companies. Um, so, the, the issue is um, they are at the AMP budget is the equivalent of most countries' GDP. So, and and just, just like that, things around nutrition, for example, it is almost impossible to get someone to invest in running a business that will actually drive prevention. Prevention is not incentivized. Dr. Murga will, will talk to you about that and how uh, I, I, he, he did allude to it a little earlier if you can catch him on a long discussion. One of the problems with, with medical personnel is that within the private sector, of course, within the public sector, no, no one is born this way. Uh, but within, uh, I mean, adequately enough for them to make a living, but within the private sector, the issue is that we are still running on a fee for service kind of um, uh, practice where you do, I, I take an injection, I book someone, and then I get money. If I talk to someone, or I, even if I, for example, um, we're talking about delivering telehealth, if a doctor speaks to someone like 20 minutes a day and tell them, I look at your exercise, uh, can I look through your menu today? The doctor gets nothing, you know? And I mean, the doctor is the counselor, whatever. We don't incentivize preventive healthcare. And without money in that, it's never going to drive anything. So, big issue pertaining to where the dollars and cents. So, the, the, that mentality has to change. It starts changing now for the better in Europe. America is still more or less of, of difficulty. The UK is not, unfortunately, doing well. Uh, we're backsliding a little bit. Uh, but Europe has done well at kind of looking at these moments. So, will it come to Malaysia? We sure as hell hope so. But the problem is, again, the big giants of disincentivization of preventive healthcare are still a lot bigger than anyone else before it was doing. So AI has helped to level it somewhat. But again, the problem with AI is that a computer is as only, or, or a solution, or, or whatever it is, is only as good as the number of people that you can deploy on the ground to be able to support it. You know, and, and the challenge is a lot of you, for example, like I what I, I work still a lot with young people, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> no, no, and not fortunately, I mean I'm happy to work with them, but unfortunately, comma, uh, within the healthcare space, four out of every ten people I meet who are trained healthcare professionals are actually leaving the space. Look, because I can do so much better as an influencer, man. <laughs> Why do I need people peeing on me? to get my salary paid, you know, serious. Yeah, so, and this is another big, like, human resource challenge. Yep, I'm pressing sorry, um, no, 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 maybe uh, one follow-up question. Um, given uh, the, the landscape that you provided to us now, uh, how, how strongly incentivizing um, towards and um, and, and um, yeah, the ones that you mentioned, which I will not elaborate on again. My question to you is, given this scenario that we have now, do you think in the next five years, or 10 years, we can solve this issue based on the current scenario? Absolutely. <coughs> Look, the people in Manila are sitting next to us, driving that change. So I'm just going to <laughs> Yeah, so, but, but that's what it takes. So Microsoft wasn't built in a day. Space, right? But that, but these are extremely disruptive technology. The, the good thing about healthcare is now that the, there is still a lot of regulation around the delivery of clinical healthcare, which is a good thing. It's not our there'll be a lot of crazy people within the space. But preventive healthcare is a relatively uh, how to say non-legal or I said less regulatory frameworks around that. So there's a lot of opportunity for people to do innovative solutions to disrupt that space now. And interestingly, again, I come back to the money story, there's still a lot more people who are not sick with money compared to people who are sick with money. So even if you made a business case, you ran a p it's just so much better to work at getting a set of customers. So, however, what people need to do is, and, and again, this, these are things that you see, a lot of monkeys are doing the same thing. We always joke about, I mean, this is probably a racist thing, qualify that. So,
So we always joke about how when one Indian chap opens an Indian restaurant on the street, within three months there will be 200 plus doing the same thing around the same street, and within a year everyone will close down. Now the problem in, in disruptive healthcare services, especially in prevention, is that we're starting to see the same pattern. And uh, you, I, I don't know how well you guys are tuned in into, like for example, the digital health landscape. We can see a lot of the first generation, second generation uh, providers are actually already collapsed. Huh? Uh, so the third, fourth generation fellows who are in, they are suffocating and dying slowly. <laughs> to pick up a term, they all are going to do compensatory failure. Yeah, so, and, and the problem is because they are unable to kind of reach that economy of scale. So, the idea, beautiful ideas, but without like direction, financial direct, like how to say financial direction, and very clear kind of business plans to execute it into the, the five to ten year space, right, are causing a lot of people who are disrupting that care to shift very early on. And very sadly, this causes their yeah, ideas to die. Thank, thank you, Dr. Murali. So, uh, moving on to Madhuha, uh, to recap the question is, in the next five to ten years, do you think uh, mental health care can be, as, uh, can be on par with physical health care? So, I'll put things into context, right? Let's look at the past five years. In 2018, there were already millions of people suffering from mental health issues. But because of the lack of awareness, nobody did anything. It, we, we, um, the government still set, set up mental health clinics, also set up all these different systems, but because of the lack of data that Dr. Murika was mentioning, they didn't really know if it was working. They couldn't identify, okay, how many people go to this clinic, how many people, um, what is the process? Once they come in, um, do they sign out after a few months? Are they okay? Are they continuously, are they dependent on these issues? And you can see that build up from what? From the suicidal rate. 2,000 people committed suicide, and most of this are those aged 15 to 18 years old. So it is an alarming issue. It is a growing issue. If we look in terms of the next five years, um, some of the challenges, and if it will more or less be on par to physical health, it will take a lot. It will take a lot simply because of the factor of economics, right? With Plus Vibes, what we aim to do is we want to lower the market rate for mental health. Why? That is the first thing that prevents people from going to seek help. You already know your stress. You need to talk to someone about it. Simply talking to a counselor itself will help you. But what do most people do? They keep it inside. They're like, oh, it's okay, it's okay, it's a small issue, it's a normal life challenge, I will get through it. But depression itself is prolonged, right? It's identified because it's prolonged. You go through one stress, it prolongs, you keep it inside you, it develops, it changes your body chemically, it might develop into mental illness because of that, because of the increased cortisol level, correct me if I'm wrong. But yes, that's what happens. Then that's where you develop depression, that's where you develop anxiety, right? So when you look at it from that point of view, and whether services are willing to lower down that 250 consultation fee, the 300 ringgit psychiatry fee, the 500 ringgit trauma abuse um, consultation fee, will people actually go for that? The first thing that they'll say is that I already went through all of this. I can't fork out another 500 for one hour because in any treatment, you need not just one session, you need a program. You need a 12 session. You need maybe two, three month session. You need six month session if you went through what I went through. You see? So in terms of accessibility, the first thing is there is a need to disrupt the whole ecosystem of mental health systems to digitalize it and make it more affordable. Now, we do have numerous clinics that are on board that are listing on Plus Vibes app because they believe in that. They believe that accessibility only comes when it's affordable. And that's where we see so many, everyone on the app in their clinic, yes, they are still charging that 250 because they have cost. But when we digitalize it, we don't have that much cost anymore, right? You can do it in your free time. We open it up for freelancers eight, um, as early as 8 a.m. and then as late as 11 p.m., you see? So that's where we get that accessibility. 
So people who do believe in, in wanting to create that social impact, in wanting to contribute and help the society and the future workforce, the future generation, the children will lower their price. But of course, in anything it's economics, it's whether it's a business, it's whether they want, they, they do it for a business, it's whether they um, want to be sustainable. So I do believe in the next five years, you will see two different shifts. You will see some people who will go all out in making it affordable and accessible. Perhaps even now, and on the app right now, we have those charging 250 outside on the app, it's 50 ringgit. Five years experience. Why? Because with that, they are able to touch lives from people in Kuda, from people in Joho, and for that itself, makes them feel good, right? It creates that social impact. Um, and at times, you will still have, and you will still need that physical clinical intervention. You will still need to go see a doctor. I wouldn't say that in the mental health industry, it would completely be digitalized, no. But the first intervention, the first stepping stone, trying out to share your problems, all those first, first things will happen online. And when you feel that, okay, now I feel comfortable enough. I feel like um, I want to try and go to a physical clinic. Perhaps there's a different program. Perhaps there's physical activities that I can actually do that can help me. So it depends. It's different types of needs. Um, what you need as an individual, um, if you have that stigma, Digital telemedicine um, is more accessible and breaks that stigma for you. But again, there will be that, that shift the term, um, based on who wants to create social impact and, and whether it's a it's business. Thank you so much, Maria. Before we turn to uh, the video, I like to tell a joke. The joke is um, sometimes I'm moderately depressed because of life events. But after I see the price for a counselor, I'm severely depressed. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I hope we change that. <laughs> that, that a joke. And, and I think uh, what I read has brought up my book many times for me is the, how much the private sector is charging for health, health services and how underpaid uh, the, the healthcare professionals are in the government sector. Um, and this economics is, has been there and it will be there. Um, here, here. <laughs> Thank you, and, and, and that's up to us. I mean, all of us are so talented here, we're so educated, and there's so many things to do um, with the qualifications that we have, with the experiences that we have, so many problems that we've described now. And now we turn to um, the field of uh, traditional and complementary medicine. So, uh, Dr. Kyo, the question is Do you think in the next five to ten years, TCM can be on par with uh, allopathic or Western medicine in our health systems? Thank you, thank you for the question. So before I answer this question, we need to know uh, what's, what happened, that is what uh, uh, Dr. Mandi has said, what happened previously. So we need to have a background knowledge of uh, what, how T and CM developed in Malaysia for past 30 years. I'm not going to talk about 30 minutes, Anna. it's in short, in 5 minutes, I'll tell you how it developed. So first, in year 2001, we have this T and CM national policy. So this in this national policy, it stated that Traditional and complementary medicine will coexist with modern medicine in national health So it gives a positioning coexist. So in 2004, the traditional and complementary medicine division was established in KL. So the function of this division is to regulate the practice of this PNCM. And then from year 2007 until now, we have 15 hospitals the Mohish hospitals with this PNCM unit, traditional and complementary medicine unit. Basically, every state we have one hospital, one government hospital with this unit, uh, besides Berlis and also Terra. So, the services we have it in these PNCM units are traditional Malay medicine, uh, Uruk Melayu, the massage, and then we have this uh, postnatal care. And for traditional Chinese medicine, we have acupuncture. And also herbal therapy. Herbal therapy as an adjunct treatment for cancer uh, in four hospitals. In the north, there is uh, Hospital Kabarabatas, and then in the, uh, we have this uh, National Cancer Institute, and then in the south, we have Hospital Sudan Ismail JB, and then Hospital Lekas. So, in this herbal therapy, and also uh, Indian medicine uh, in different uh, hospitals. So, with uh, these uh, TNCM services established in government hospital, the next step is a very uh, important or crucial milestone for this uh, TNCM development. It is the TNCM Act. 
traditional and complementary medicine act 2016. So with the establishment of uh, with the introduction of this act, uh, they give a position or they give a position or recognition to these PMCM practitioners in Malaysia. So currently, uh, in two, from 2007 uh, 2017, uh, seven recognized practice area in PMCM. So three traditional medicine, traditional Malay medicine, traditional Indian medicine, traditional Chinese medicine. And then for the complementary medicine, osteopathy, chiropractic, homeopathy, and also Islamic medical practices. So these seven uh, practices are recognized under this act. And then from next year onwards, from February 2024 onwards, anyone who wants to practice these seven practice area must register with ENCM Council. ENCM Council is like ENCM Malaysia Medical Council. So they must re uh, register with ENCM Council or else they cannot practice. But this also means that this practitioner will be held accountable to their practice. They will need to be uh, uh, accountable. So with uh, this uh, ENCM Act, then the next step is ENCM Blueprint. So together with uh, Boston Consulting Group uh, and also the uh, WHO, we have developed a TNCM blueprint in 2018. So this 10 years blueprint uh, from 2018 to 2027, uh, we focus on four areas, practice, product, research, and education. How Malaysia TNCM field is going to progress in this four uh, direction, this uh, blueprint. And also uh, this year, we have the first, first in the world, uh, ENCM research framework. Because previously, uh, in other countries, even in China and US, we are using the scientific way or modern medicine uh, method to examine the more traditional and complementary medicine. For example, in China, we, but we use scientific method to look into, to investigate the uh, traditional Chinese medicine. There are a lot of research gaps. So that's why millions have been spent, but then not many, uh, very, not many promising uh, result was uh, is there. So they have changed. So Malaysia we have developed this research paper, meaning meaning that we use ENCM method to have research on ENCM uh, practice. However, uh, it is still evidence based medicine uh, because we know that okay, to answer that question, uh, how to be on par? First, we need to. Uh, collaborate before we compare, we need to collaborate with uh, modern medicine. We are talking about integrative uh, medicine. Previously, it is all alternative medicine. Like in the US, before this uh, was uh, CAM. You can see here a lot of uh, not our CAM today. Uh, CAM is complementary and alternative medicine. So it was practiced in the uh, US. But then in two years, 2015, they have changed to complementary and integrative medicine. Why they changed is because they noted that. After billions spent, they noted that this traditional or complementary medicine they cannot uh, alternate or replace the modern medicine, but they can complement or integrate into the modern medicine for the benefit of the patient. So the, the direction has been uh, changed. So now the challenges uh, of this integration, uh, what's happening is that from 2007 until now, it has, it has been integrated into the hospital, MOH hospital. But then in the private sector, uh, most of these uh, practices are still standalone practices uh, like private PCM center, private medicine center. So I just recently joined a UCSI uh, group. So my UCSI PNCM center, we are the center which uh, applied to the UCSI hospital and UCSI university, meaning that we integrate the clinical research and education all in. So this is uh, what we are trying to do and progress in the private sector. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Theo. Um, I think it sounds like PC, uh, PNCM is moving quite progressively and uh, well done, Dr. Theo. Thank you for your service for this country. Um, February 2024, there will be a PNCM, oh, no, uh, the council, sorry, what's the council? Tradition and complementary medicine. PNCM council, yes. I, I think that's a great step uh, towards uh, governance issue that you brought up earlier. Now, um, is PNCM is growing quite well. Let's say seventy percent. Uh, hundred percent is the ideal. Say seventy, eighty percent. Mental health. What, what would you give a number? Uh, awareness wise, or 
every day um, to be on par with physical health. Out of the five, I still give it a three. It's there, but it depends. Yeah. Definitely, what about cancer? <laughs> 40 percent. Oh, okay. So that's so two out of five, three out of five, four out of five, for example. Now, um, looking at all the talents that we have here today, and I like to tie into what Dr. Burger has uh, mentioned earlier, which is very important: the advent of technology, and all the digital health tools, Internet of Things, wearables, uh, cloud data, AI, ML, and all the jargons. Very important. Now, the question uh, to our panel speakers is. What do you see as the technology tool or, or uh, advancements that can be a game changer to move two out of five to five, three out of five to five, four out of five to five? Is there any technology that you're looking at right now or you think can really contribute to accelerate uh, the progress in your respective fields? So um, uh, I'll start with uh, maybe my tablets and then the video and the So when we talk about technology, it's like what everyone is talking about, AI. To what extent can AI replace humans for mental health therapy sessions, consults, consultations, diagnosis? See, most of you shaking your heads, exactly. You still need that human touch. You know, when you see, when telemedicine, yeah, sure. Um, when you see an AI, you already know it's an AI. I mean, maybe 10 years down the road, maybe, okay, maybe five years, let's see how fast it goes. You won't be able to detect, right? We see that nowadays, you know, in social media, you can see so many of these um, soon-to-be influences where they create humans, and then those are going to be the ones that will fash, um, you know, dress up and become influences, but they're AI. So same thing. Um, but empathy, human language, maybe even dialect. Um, there's a lot of different things that play into role when it comes to AI. Um, but of course, on our app, what happens is the first thing people will say, am I chatting with a bot? That's the first thing. Why is it that they want to feel that they're chatting with another human being? They want to feel a human connection, even if they can't see that person, even if they don't know that person. Knowing that the other person is human means that that person understands real life challenges, understands and sees and perhaps knows someone who goes through something or perhaps they know um, they have a sense of um, softness or touch towards a certain specific issue of which an AI doesn't. But moving forward, we will definitely see telemedicine adopting AI. I think a lot of um, European apps already use this. A very famous one is Visa. So Visa uses um, chatbots. Um, I would say I used it. And it's very engaging. But it's you click buttons. So it's like, you know, you, there's an answer. And then you click this or this, this or this. And it'll give you the predetermined answers that they already have. Right? So if you keep talking to it, what will happen? It will give you those predetermined answers. So to what extent do you feel like, okay, you can talk to this person every day, you can depend on them, get new inputs? Not really, right? It's like you're talking to ChatGPT. To some extent, they'll say, oh, sorry, my database doesn't have that kind of information or I'm not programmed. And that will just leave you with a very miserable, you know, feeling that, okay, I was talking to an AI. So yes, technology, AI, it will simplify things. It will provide the first point of entry, maybe what are the things that you're feeling, what are um, certain things that you're, the situations that you face, emotions, it will analyze you based on that, but it will still require, just like in physical healthcare, it will still require that human touch. One thing that will really improve and create, make it more accessible is what we are seeing now today, so many mobile apps. Why is it? It's because everyone's getting used to it, right? Everyone is so used to being on their phones in front of a screen, in front of a computer, that it's just become a norm for us to depend on things and to use services that are on our phones. And it's all about accessibility. Moving forward, you will see these apps, including Plus Fives, onboarding counselor psychologists across the globe. So you will get accessible counselors and psychologists from different parts of the continent. And that's what technology is all about, right? Pulling in all that talent and making it accessible, globalization, towards anyone who wants to use it. 
Are there pros and cons? Yes. Does it still need a human touch? Yes. Like in any industry, I still feel that even with physical health, yes, there will be all those doctors, robots. Same with um, perhaps mental health. Well, they create, I think it's called Sophia, like a robot. Perhaps they will train it to have empathy, but still people will still prefer a human touch. Thank, thank you, Maria. Um, so, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sorry, and uh, I, I really agree with the need for human touch in healthcare. In fact, that's something that cannot be replicated in the point of being with AI. So and thank you for bringing that up. And we have a, a, a large boom in mobile apps and mobile app, digital healthcare apps, um, but still the human touch is very important. So uh, while we turn to uh, Dr. Thiel, um, I'd like to add on um, the question. The question initially was, what's a game-changing technology that you see uh, that can accelerate the growth of these PNCF Malaysia? I'll add on to that and say, um, do you think, uh, maybe take a step back, do you think a technology is the solution at all to accelerate PNCF in Malaysia? Over the thank you. Um, before we start, we start, we need to recap what Dr. Mulugla uh, explained just now about AI. This AI uh, it is a game changer for modern medicine because with all these uh, smart devices, uh, they have helped the physician to track all these clinical data and help in their clinical decision. So we know that in modern medicine, we are using the scientific way. The scientific way, we uh, give an example, the uh, hypothesis deduction method, meaning that we have a hypothesis, then we have this option A and B, then with the deduction process, we deduce and come out with a conclusion. So in medicine, it's like someone presented with a problem, complaint, and then with this physical examination, laboratory, and also imaging method, we will come to a different uh, differential diagnosis, meaning that there's a few diagnosis, and then you need to choose one of it and then come to a conclusion and give to them. So, this is the modern medicine uh, method. And AI has helped in this, uh, in this uh, aspect. So, in traditional medicine, uh, how AI is changing the traditional medicine practices is uh, first you need to know how traditional medicine look at patient. Uh. So uh, when we see a patient uh, using the four diagnostic method, which is the inspection, it's for some traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, we look at how the patient walk, the gait, the facial, uh, the expression, and then the color of the tongue, the coating of the tongue. So inspection, that inquiry will ask some questions. And then uh, the uh, palpation and the consultation. Palpation, you know that you always, you know, in the drama series, you take the pulse and the pulse and the test. So, with all these diagnostic methods, they will come to a conclusion what is the PCM pattern. This PCM pattern, you know, in PCM, we say yin and yang, and for fire and water. Yin and yang is excessive or deficiency or something like that. So, this is a PCM pattern. And then, with this PCM pattern, based on the previous knowledge, which is the knowledge in the ancient text. When we, take, when we talk about ancient text in PCM, uh, it's not like modern medicine. Modern medicine has a history of 250 years. In traditional Chinese medicine, it's 2,000 years ago. So when we as, when I study in Beijing, uh, we look at this ancient text uh, 2,000 years ago. Okay? So, uh, however, this knowledge evolved. Uh, so this PCM practitioner, they need to use all this knowledge and then to try to uh, relate to the patient's complaint and come up with a PCM diagnosis and give this treatment. The treatment, let's say there is a yin deficiency, so we supplement the yin. Yang excessive, uh, so we do the corresponding treatment. Now, either it's in herbs or in acupuncture, so you can see the uh, progress. Uh. Now, how AI has changed this uh, is from each level. So, the past five years, uh, China and also US, they have been taking all these information from the ancient text for the past 2,000 years and put inside a database. Okay. So 2,000 years of which are in one database and then together with more than 100 of these PCM master, so called PCM master, 80 years old, 100 years old, PCM master, because they are passed down from generation to generation. If they uh, pass away this inheritance or the loss of this information. So what they do is they interview and then they take all the information, look at their prescription, their function point, and then they connected all this information. So this is the second uh, data 
who uh, first is the all the ancient text two thousand years, and then this uh, DCM master's experience, and then that one. The past fifty years research, what have been done in DCM? So all the uh, research uh, findings, they integrate all these three. So after they integrate all these three and put into one platform, and it's the apps have been created actually. So uh, with one hand code, when you see the patient, then you can put in a what's the com uh, complaint and others. Then you take the pulse. What's the pulse? The pulse is big, the pulse is wiry. Then what's the color of the tongue? What's the color of the tongue? You put in, you generate a diagnosis, differential diagnosis, including if it's an emergency which requires modern medicine intervention, say, oh, then you need to refer to modern medicine. So if this has uh, already changed the whole practice of the DCM. And then uh, this is only uh, the diagnosis part. There's another part which is uh, as AI assisted device, meaning that we take pulse. You say this is wiry pulse, but another person says uh, it's a uh, big pulse. Then how are you going to standardize the pulse taking? When you look at the tongue, you say it's red color, but from another angle, maybe it's a dark red. This is dark red. So with this uh, AI uh, ribbon, Device, it also can help in this analysis. That's why you can see AI actually will change, but this AI hasn't really come into the issue in this people. I know this actually last month. Last month when I went to Beijing, uh, there's an overseas uh, international conference when, when they presented their research finding in this. So they already started uh, implementing in China. So one doctor, TCM doctor in rural area, usually they can see only five to six patients. But with this uh, AI assisted apps, right, from six patients, you can see 70 patients. And then high accuracy to follow up. Because uh, once they give this treatment, then when patient goes back, then any changes of the symptoms will apply using the uh, chat, uh, chat box and this the uh, WhatsApp. Lab. And then from there they gather, and once the information feedback given by this uh, customer, right, the computer will, the AI will uh, this analyze, analyze and they say, okay, this is the changes of the prescription that you need to make. And then this will help the doctors uh, to have this on the job training. So it's like 2,000 years of text, 100 PCM master, and also all the research uh, finding helping you to draw this patient. So you can see how AI will change, but it doesn't come into Thank you. That's so amazing. I think that's a word for it. clinical musicians are more or something like that to be used. That I used to use uh, when I was practicing in clinic, and I forget the dosage for children, especially. It's not easy to remember. Um, I go open my blue book and I see the weight of the child, and, uh, and the naughty CM has advanced so much. So let's turn to um, Dr. Murali and they were applying my book. Uh, we still have time. Um, uh, let's uh, tell you uh, Dr. Wei, the same question. Um, what's a game-changing technology that you think uh, may be very useful for uh, in your field in cancer? Sure. Um, thanks. So, uh, unfortunately, from the time we started the session until now, it's been a few hours. It's at least about 200 new innovations that have come up. So, if you, if you Google, I think you'll find that So, for me, the, the issue isn't technology. So, my game-changer isn't technology. My, um, I would say, Single payer integration system. So it's a systems change that I'm looking uh, to hopefully be the biggest game changer because all these lovely innovations have a slight problem with the back end of it. Somebody has to pay. And whether it's the government or it's individuals, someone the, the money has to come from somewhere. It's because the government's money comes from you as well, right? It's like tax. So the, the problem that we're having, and, and this is the big challenge going forward in healthcare, is that healthcare becomes more expensive. It's, it's ridiculous. Medical inflation is very high, but at the same time, we are actually growing a lot older, a lot sicker, so it's a lot more expensive to deliver healthcare as well. But the problem is we grow old, but we're non-contributory. So it'd be easier if everyone died at the same. Uh, so the problem is, uh, we don't have enough money. This is not a Malaysian problem, it's globally as well. This is why systems everywhere look to be more and more fragile. So in Malaysia, the, the big fix that we need is, one, move somewhere where we can have much more money. So how do we get there? 
it has to be a mix of sure the government has to fund a little more but it's going to be a lot of individuals actually putting forward like some kind of financial community so um we i mean words like social health insurance people start throwing this into the mix sure i, I mean again i don't think there's going to be one one solution it's all it's going to be many different solutions like i i actually i'm, I'm very happy with myself i haven't used a single food analogy i'm always famous for using food analogies and i will go to that today right away nasi goreng is never as good as nasi goreng um, <laughs> and I'm not from Vietnam, so this is very general. So, like anything, health financing, that, that, that quick fix needs to be a mix of all these different uh, kind of things. Now, the problem is, okay, who's going to pay? Only 22% of Malaysians actually have private health insurance. We still fall back on this idea that Saturday, large group, and also you have a mind for that. I, if you talk to my colleagues in the Ministry of Health who work in the back end, um, even at this one million, five million, right, there's about close to, a, a, if I'm not mistaken, close to 400 million ringgit in debt, you know. It's people don't pay when they check out, like when they, when they get discharged from hospital. First, we, we, we let them get discharged, right? So, the problem, the perennial problem is there's no money. So, but that is a, is a mindset that has to change. So, for example, uh, about 12 or 14 years ago, I worked with the government in Japan to actually develop uh, something called long-term care insurance. So for the Japanese, from the time they start working at the age of 20, 21, okay, or whatever they say, 19, from whatever that money that they have uh, from their salary, a small portion is deducted out for health insurance, which is useful for them today. But there's an even smaller portion that gets deducted out for something called long-term care insurance which only kicks in after the age of 65. So that's how, and, and this is a 15 year, 15 year ago full story. You know, so pe people at that point are already worried about, we don't live past Wednesday. You know, we are all we're concerned there is like, how can I get past next week? So um, that, that, that mentality onto the tax system, onto how we finance healthcare has to come together, one. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, I'm just taking a little bit of time. With this. And the second kind of integrated problem is that this country is both heaven and hell. You know, uh, what is it? We put down Sarah specialist side, this is like a couple of doors away. It's not a bad hospital, but, um, but it's slightly old. Down Sarah specialist hospital, too. I don't work there, but it's amazing. It's like uh, you're going to Waldorf Astoria. You know, it's super atas. Okay? But. 20, about you know, maybe 30 minutes away in the jam is KK Taman Meta. And don't know whether any of you all have been to KK Taman Meta. Very enlightening visit. Go and visit. They actually renovated, so it's a bit better now. Please don't tell me because I want your words in KK So it's, it's really a, 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 a country of extremes simply because our private healthcare runs on this, this huge different uh, machine that finances it. And then, then there's our public health care system, which is just hovering around uh, the space of nothing. So we've been trying, people at Dr. Muga have been trying for decades to kind of integrate it. Lovely integration. The two best things that happened out of COVID for me uh, in, for Malaysia. One is um, AI. Before that, you know, one idiot want to put a phone to look at a telemedicine consult. Uh, now, my 73-year-old grand-aunt is doing uh, Zoom with uh, with the endocrine knowledge is amazing. Um, and the second is this integration. So we could integrate during COVID, private, public, everyone worked together. Post COVID, now we're back to square one back again. So until we integrate these two different worlds and we figure out how to pay, this will be the game changer. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> so, um, uh, we have two minutes uh, left uh, for us to wrap up. I'd like to open to the floor if there's any burning question that uh, you think others may benefit from the answer. Um, uh, please raise your hand. Um, so we have uh, it, it, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I'm lucky enough. <laughs> um, I visit from National Health Society in Asia. So one of the pain points uh, I think in healthcare is definitely financing. 
uh, if you get sick with cancer, even your medication that will last for two weeks can easily cost up to 13,000 per box. Um, so when we talk about you know money, when we talk about financing healthcare, there's always two things in our mind. Number two, uh, number one is either the healthcare providers lower their price, um, and the other two is either you know somebody else has to pay for it. So when we talk about social impact, we always want the social impact workers to actually pitch it. You're working in the social impact sector, do more, but receive pay for less. But that's actually quite unfair because charity, even charity runs on money. What we do on the ground, it actually requires money. Um, we actually run three trucks and the trucks run on petrol to be able to reach the communities that have problems to access. So fundamentally, the issues with access is actually also money. If you don't have money, you don't have education. If you don't have education, you don't have a career. And if you don't have a career, you can't even afford a handphone and an internet line. That means you can get access to education and awareness for things like mental health, things like cancer. So what alone, if we move forward with technology, you'll be left behind when everybody is having teleconsultations and getting in touch with doctors. So one of the things that I feel is crucial is also career. But for people with non communicable diseases, um, you know, things like cancer, things like mental health, when you walk into an interview, if these things are declared immediately, you are either you don't get considered, or of course people will fear to hire you for the fact that you have a lot of treatments to go through, and um, you also require a lot of findings. So I think the I'm a believer of system practice. That means I also believe that you know there's no one solution. Everybody has to come together. I just have a question: How do we move forward, especially in terms of you know um, encouraging employers to be part of this system? Whereby you don't have to overlook mental health or cancer, um, you know, when hiring. But how do we encourage them towards being a supportive employer um, while also, you know, um, adding on to their values when they hire? So how do we stop from people losing their job if they get diagnosed with cancer or mental health? How do we move forward from here? Because I also believe that future isn't just about technology. It also about how do we move forward from the problems that are currently and perhaps in the past have been dominating us. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Isa, for the um, question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, uh, so, so I, I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll dedicate this question to Mahima uh, on how do you convince corporates and employers to treat their employees better in the field of now? Um, yeah, I think it's a very good question. Um, one thing that we found was that when there is more awareness, when there is more data that is available concerning mental health, the employees do open their eyes. They know. So what we do is we analyze the data and we present it every quarter. How many people are suicidal? What are the issues? Child care, financial relationship, some workplace bosses. Are they supported enough, uh, supportive enough to maybe even add on certain additional values or benefits or wellness programs? I would honestly say no. Why? Because at the end of the day, it goes down to their bottom line. It goes down to whether they make profit, whether they have that budget. A lot of things about budget. So when we speak to employers that, we've, that have been with us for the past three years, initially their budget was X. But as we grew with them, and as they added more employees, what happened was we had that data. That data presents this, 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 this. This department has this issue because of this. This department is so detailed, but are you willing to fork out an extra 10, 20K? While we might think it's minimal for the impact that it will create for the employees, in the end, they're like, oh yes, okay, but we've allocated the budget for something else. You see? So then it goes back to, to what extent, what is the actual factor that will make them, okay, let's do it now. And there is. Employees where they see that there suicide, um, there are suicidal employees and it does affect the co-worker. So this suicidal employee does directly affect and they can see it. Why? Because it's something that they can see, like physical health. You immediately get that support because it's something you can see. So. In terms of supportive, they will only be supportive. Data is data, but they will only be supportive when they see that it directly impacts the, impacts the whole 
what Fuller's department and that kind of thing. So if it's a budget issue, it will take a while to change. This is why. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. So we have time for one more last question before we wrap up. Um, but um, uh, I guess uh, you sent an invited as a next panel speaker. Um, <laughs> but so, so my point is, uh, please keep it as a question. Um, Hi, my name is Adriana, and I'm Shivana, 2506. So my question is in relation to our topic, the movie I did earlier, we spoke about, uh, uh, sorry, about the technology part of it, system, um, um, safety of the data. Because as we know, the hackers, you know, they love, and each lens tweet is how they, what they love right now is data instead of gold and whatnot. So I attended a forum yesterday which talks about this, how easily hackable our systems are, whether in public or private. Um, having technology is fine, but we don't protect our the data, our, the consumers out there, the, the patients. The ramifications, I think, can be very far-reaching, not be paranoid here, but you know, the data can be can be turned, can be can be our for example, my blood type can easily be uh, changed from O positive to God knows what. And if I were to get into an accident and go to the hospital and somebody were to check what my blood type is, and because the actor has miraculously managed to change it, then uh, I suppose my treatment will be uh, impacted. So um, have you thought about how that sort of protection, data protection for the system, we were talking about uh, integrating the system, but the back end protection of uh, data security um, you know, you foresee how we can minimize the risk of, of it being breached, for example. Because uh, the law that we currently have at the moment is uh, consumer information can be used provided uh, notice is being sent to the consumer. So most consumers, we just have a template. You know, I can't say no. If I say no, I can't access the service. So that's the issue. Even at the moment, if let's say uh, if we have a, a holistic law, privacy law, that covers everything, not just not just corporations out there, but at the moment there's no law which, which uh, regulates or, or say, uh, protects our individual confidential data. So that PPA doesn't actually. But even if we have such a law, but uh, what, the, what the, the service provider can use is even notice saying, here, sign this before you get the service, sign this, agree, you can use it however we want. And you know, it's still, it's still the same mode. So those two things are how to protect uh, data breaches and uh, actually protect our data from, you know, you understand or not? Yes. Not use it, not use it as, uh, as a blackmail location. Yes. Unless you agree to this, you're not going to get a service, thanks. Um, so the question is how to protect our data? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. Um, got it. I think um, <coughs> Dr. Kyo kind of explained this very succinctly, very interestingly, because he spoke about this um, space this new space evolving around PCM, PCNF. And um, the issue is exactly that of what you were talking about, which is regulatory uh, oversight and the kind of governance frameworks. So, um, and, and, and you're, you're absolutely right in pointing this out. Uh, and this is perhaps another failing of us in the sense that both the regulatory framework and the kind of legal uh, kind of settings uh, in digital health have been unfortunately a bit lacking and and uh, there's been a lot of work being done to catch that up now so for example agent, uh, very um, powerful government agencies are finally now being tasked with getting this done for example NDEC uh, and the, the Ministry of uh, Multimedia and uh, yeah so and the Commission so they're actually getting their act together they're, they're putting in frameworks almost every like two weeks or so we all getting called to like Give, provide comments, input, and on how they shape and, and come up with like stronger uh, policies and, and kind of oversight. Among, among this is going to be for sure that all providers want need to conform to a standard of digital security before they actually get registered as providers. Remember, Dr. Kyo was, was telling you the same thing about practitioners. You will at some point have a council, they need to register every day, to, like, they get audited, like, are you guys competent enough to practice? This will apply again not only to digital health practitioners but also to those platforms in which they practice as well. So that, that's coming under governance as well. So slow but coming uh, and just to share. So this is how the mark we are. So for example, um, Mariha spent quite a bit of time talking to you about uh, teleconsultation, right? Lovely counselors, psychologists, everyone. 
but for doctors, technically, in Malaysia is still illegal. Huh? Yeah, just to share with you. So everyone is doing it because we actually don't have permission to do it. We had a short window of permission granted by the medical council during COVID that has now been removed. Uh, so anybody who's doing consult teleconsultation technically is illegal. From a medical, if you are a medical practitioner. Huh? So we're slowly catch up again that Malaysia will it one day. <laughs> Yeah, uh, a small thing like just now when you say, you know, somebody might have a change of your blood. So actually, this uh, a few years ago, we wanted to do this uh, public-private partnership, and this was the issue. The actually, uh, I mean, the government was willing to share the data, the GPs were willing to share, but uh, the specialist hospital somewhat they didn't want to share the patient data. And so, if you take a chest X-ray in. Uh, uh, KPJ, and then they go to the government hospital. The government hospital doesn't have your x ray, they have to do it again. And then, if you come to me in a GP, I will have to do it again. So, now to actually, uh, because they didn't want to share the data because of all these uh, security problems and all that, now the apps are I hold my own data, the patient holds their data. That means I go to KPJ, KPJ uploads everything with me. Or if they don't want, if the assistant doesn't talk to my app, I can upload it myself. My 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 CT scan, my reports, uh, my blood investigations, everything. And then when I go to another doctor, I can choose which uh, visit to, to share. If I don't want to share with him my blood investigation, I can uh, I don't have to share that with him. So these are things that actually we are learning on how to protect our own data. So it's uh, one whole thing that we have to go around. Becoming like trial and error, we're learning from mistakes. But uh, like I said, it's a global thing, uh, so we learn. And uh, recently, this app was actually, I mean, it's uh, already there. They're launching it in, in January, where right? you can download it for free and you can actually upload your own data. And so your records are with you. And you know, you know more, like they ask you where's your prescription, and you know where, or where's your, the, your x ray, you know, you don't know everything you can do it in the app. And, then, and it's safe, and it's no one can hack because it's not sitting in a server, so you, they can't hack it unless you you lose your phone or you, know, you give your password to somebody. It's coming on. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Muga. Thank you for the wonderful question. Um, I guess uh, Dr. Muga has given a glimpse of um, the framework that um, that we're building now. Who stores the data? Who owns the data? Who has, has access to the data? And uh, we're in the works right now, as uh, Dr. Muri has described. So uh, with that, uh, I'd love to um, uh, close up uh, with a uh, word of thanks to our distinguished speakers over here, your wonderful attention and your questions as well. So uh, I'll pass the time back to our committee, but for that, uh, let us give a round of applause for our
do a test. One, two, and three. Okay. Everyone get in position. Okay. Uh, yeah. One, two, here, down. Yeah, can you even come to me? Or get a lunch. And now get the camera. Okay, okay. All right, three, two, one. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one,
So we're framing disability from the medical model. Disability is presented as a problem of the person directly caused by disease, trauma, or some other health condition which requires sustained medical care. So, medical model, hearing loss, sustained medical care, my hearing aids. My bipolar disorder, I am on five or six types of medication. I've been so uh, on the meds for at least 11 years and therapy. So that's through the medical model. <laughs> there are other models. Uh, this is actually quite, I want to say, quite prevalent in society, the tragedy or charity model. The tragedy or the charity model of disability depicts disabled persons as victims of circumstances who are deserving of victims. Someone who gets into an accident, uh, loses the limbs, or loses control over the limbs. 
that's a tragedy. And, and, and coming from a um, uh, segment of the disabled community which has invisible disabilities, <laughs> a lot of times it goes to this, the moral model. The moral model of disability refers to the attitude that people are morally responsible for their own disability. For example, that the disability may be seen as a result of the bad actions of the parents, or the result of practicing this kind. Some people may laugh, but <laughs> there is a general, I don't, I don't want to say extreme really, but there, there are ideas that revolve around people with mental disorders, are not close to God, we generally hear this. So the, the area of work that I primarily work in, the model that I use, how I frame disability, and actually I believe this model is how Malaysia, at least on paper, frames disability, is the social model. <coughs> disability is not the impairment. My hearing loss is not the impairment. Sorry, my, my hearing loss is not the disability. Disability is the result of an interaction of an individual with a health condition, like bipolar disorder, hearing loss, with personal or environmental factors, including negative attitudes, inaccessible transportation, and public buildings and limited social support. Now, I am going to say some, bring up some things that were mentioned in the previous session, not to call people out, but this is coming from a place of love. Okay? A lot of um, stigma around disability. It's not perpetuated by outright declarations of hate, although they do happen. So part of my job is actually, um, I don't know how online you guys are, but I'm really online. So um, things like um, OKU, persons with disabilities are a waste of tax payment. That has been repeated to me many, many times. I've seen that repeated to me. So the impairment itself is not the disability, but the interaction of a person with a health condition interacting with negative social norms and inaccessible public spaces is what causes disability. Why do I bring up negative social norms and why do I bring up it's not always because of outright declarations of hate? And this is where this is going to come from a place of love. The previous time, no? Um, Moderator made a joke about therapy. A lot of people who don't go to therapy laugh along. I'm not judging, I'm just, these are just observations. But for people who go to therapy, this is something that we face on a daily basis that our, again, I'm not shaming you, right? Sure. But this is something that we face on a regular basis, especially if you're living with an invisible disability. I was actually very, very happy when I got my hearing aid because now my disability is visible and I don't need to. I've had comments in the last few days uh, where I spoke to people and told them about the work that I do. <coughs> and I also mentioned that I'm disabled. And a lot of the comments were like, but you don't look disabled. So these are the negative social norms that are pervasive and prevalent. That are actually the disabling factors, not in manner. Oops, sorry. So how we conceptualize disability and why is it important? Why is the social model important? Concept, how we conceptualize disability influences how we interact with it. How we, so going back to what I said earlier, how we frame questions influences what answers we get. So if you're going to frame it with a medical model, you're going to look, uh, uh, if you're going to frame disability through the medical lens, you're going to address it only through medical means. I've got a lot of stuff running in my head. I'm trying, I will try to make it very, very coherent for you guys to follow along. The social model thing, the disability is important because it removes the burden of stigma and related baggage from the individual. Okay, sorry. So there are a few, I, I'm going to rush really fast through these things because um, I want to get to the conjecture part. Right? So there are several disability concepts, but it's health. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. This is very important to understand because 
even in our recently, um, uh, even our recent help by people, um, because I work in the area of social determinism, blah, 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 good and bad outcome, health, good or bad health outcomes, there's a 40% contributing factor from social economics. 40%. Health behaviors, 20%. Health interventions, 10%. Health intervention means direct medical access. Health behaviors means diet and exercise. But social economic factors. Since this health white paper came out, have we shifted 40% of our resources in dealing with mental ill health, mental disorders, towards dealing with social economic factors? Uh, that's a rhetorical question. We don't need to answer. So in disability advocacy, there's a term called reasonable accommodation. Some people, if you've been in the UK, you may have uh, heard the reasonable adjustment, right? So what are reasonable accommodations? They are necessary and appropriate modifications and adjustments, not imposing uh, blah, 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 okay. You know what's the important point? Necessary and appropriate modifications and adjustment, not imposing a disproportionate amount. I want you to ignore that part. To ensure to PWD the enjoyment of or exercise, ignore on an equal basis of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. I know that some of my colleagues, some of my peers in advocacy, will argue over, oh, let's just use reasonable adjustments because accommodation sounds like a cop out. And I agree up to a point. My disagreement between reasonable accommodations and adjustment is. Who defines reasonable? On a panel, again, this is coming from a place of love. On a panel talking about the future of health, we have no client groups. We have no client reps. The actual consumers of healthcare services are not represented. On the health white people advisory number, half of them are private healthcare interests. The other half, public or academics. No client groups. And within that segment of client groups, no disabled persons were involved. So this is the question. I'm actually trying to lead you to conclusions that you can make on your own. My issue is not with this word. My issue is with who defines reasonable. When was the last time you had a disabled person leading a workshop or giving a talk? When was the last time you saw a disabled person in public life not having to, not being asked about disability? We're only asked about disability, we're not asked about anything else. And I, at this point, I want to also acknowledge that I am here M, Malay, Muslim, and male. So that already gives me a lot of privilege. Uh, if I had my it would be a disabled single mother from Ulu Bukidu speaking here. But these are, I would say, um, I'm going to quote my friend Nasro. These are negative multipliers of inaccessibility. So, are they disabled? What, are, what is universal design? You design the products, environments, programs, and services to be used by all people. <laughs> but in Malaysia, universal design is generally only apply to buildings, physical spaces. But processes are not built to be accessible. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, last year, uh, the former KPWKM Women's Minister, uh, Rina Harun, to great fanfare, announced you can now register for the OP card online. Which was, oh, okay, that's great. You know what's the problem? The process itself is not accessible. The website is not accessible at all. Instructions are in the JPEG format. You cannot scale the JPEG up and down, so it's hard to view on mobile. Using uh, a JPEG, the nice persons who are using screen reader technology to access information with no uh, image encryption, and a lot of process still needs to be done offline. But everyone applauded because, yay, we are helping the disabled. In that for a minute, eh? helping the disabled. This is the area I work in, right space inclusion. And what do I mean by right space inclusion? 
generally at the least the boring part. I'll just skip through this very, very quickly. So there's a thing called the convention on the rights of persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. It's called the CFP. We ratified it in, I want to say, 2010. And what is the CFP? It's basically a document that countries sign on to and then ratify so that they domesticate, that means in their own country's laws, they domesticate this principle, promote, protect, and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons of disabilities. This building itself does not allow some classes of disabled persons entry. This building itself denies entry to some people. We step here. We just can go up on the stage. So where is the universal design? Right. And a lot of people out there, uh, and this is just going to be a little bit of you whining. So some people talk, talk about special needs, and I understand why some people would prefer that term. Because disabled is very stigmatized, okay, you is very stigmatized, so you, let's run away, let's be more polite and use other terms. But does that politeness lead to more access? Does that politeness lead to a reduction in stigma? Or does that politeness lead to non-discrimination in spaces and processes and environments and in employment, in education? Personal independence have the same needs as everyone else. Food, shelter, housing, health care, education, love, security, and personhood. These are all the same. Why are, why are non disabled calling it special needs? I would call them unmet needs. And based on the health care paper, 40% of community factors from socioeconomics to good or bad health outcomes, these unmet needs lead to bad health outcomes. And I'm not using health in the very narrow sense of medical health. But in the sense that is not just the absence of disease or infirmity, but the complete social, mental, physical, psychological well being of a person. I really like this paper, I should buy one. A funny story when I got this hearing aids, I asked, so the audiologist, where you start with audiologist here? One, I know this one is it. Okay, three seconds, there is <laughs> Ask the audiologist, uh, the other lady asked me what color do you want? I want something bright, red, maybe neon yellow. And the other, what the audience told me was something which I should have expected, but it still caught me by surprise. We don't have anything in those colors. You know why? All of them are in skin tone. Why? Rhetorical question. Yeah. <laughs> Persons with disability acts so we ratify the CRPD, then we did this whole act about the other businesses. Universal access is not mandated in any area of life, no discrimination are mandated. The human resource minister himself barely two weeks ago said there is no reason, there is no need for specific legislation to protect disabled persons in employment. Barely two weeks ago. Now, remember the social model? Right. When a person with a health condition interacts with negative social norm, i.e., stigma or discrimination, but the human resource means that you need. Because why we only have eight cases of discrimination? You know what's the funny thing about that? Those eight cases were for non disabled persons. You know why no discrimination against disabled persons in employment? Because we're not hired. We're not hired. Whenever hire, so we can't be discriminated in employment. And, and I, I do know that some corporations hire, okay, but it's not out of the goodness of their hearts. It is to earn fraction rates. We are reduced to mere functions of the economy. Disabled persons. Okay, so no redress mechanisms are prescribed. The state, the state, the country, the government, and its agents are protected. From legal action for discrimination. So I cannot sue the government for discriminating against me. We also have the National PWU Action Plan 2016 2022. Anyone ever heard of this? Yeah? Okay, you know what? Because disabled persons were not involved in the formation of the plan. Policy statement 
This is a, this all sounds really good. I just I'm just gonna breeze through. This policy prioritizes human rights values as a dignity, respect, freedom to labor, grant, to live independently. This is very important. Independent living. A lot of people say, oh, why are you making so much money? Just ask for help. The question is, I mean, the issue is, we don't want to ask for help all the time. We want to live independently. Objectives. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Ensuring that PWD enjoys the rights, opportunities, and equitable access under the country law. But the Human Resource Minister says he reads that now, he does need discrimination protection. Eliminating <laughs> discrimination against PWD. Educating and increasing community awareness about the rights of PWD. But I would say probably maybe five people have heard in this room. Only five people have heard of the national PWD. So where is the education? Where is the increasing awareness? So what's next? Okay, I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna bring up some stuff that I wanted to talk about. Oh, I also forgot. Some of my friends are here. Uh, and my colleague Shah is here. Uh, Shah is autistic. So in my organization, I only hire disabled people. So I have a video teacher. It's a principal decision. It's a conscious choice. Because I want to turn it around and say, in a lot of employment situations, uh, persons with disabilities are first allowed to be hired and the first to be fired. There's an uh, ongoing discussion right now on social media about some corporations using uh, persons with disability to reflect uh, from boycotts that they are experiencing. And uh, everyone's talking about it, and everyone is making it up themselves. And no one's talking to the disabled persons themselves. How do you feel being used at all? How do you feel being used as a tax rebate? No one's asking the disabled persons. Okay. Anyway, back to Shah. Shah is applying for Chevrolet. So be nice. Um, they are planning to network. But um, bear in mind, Shah is autistic and has issues with social interactions. So just if you notice that Shah doesn't respond in ways that you would expect a child to respond, don't pay attention. Okay? So, okay, so what's next? I just want to bring that some stuff up. I want to thank Dr. Murali for bringing up uh, incentives. Uh, talking about incentives in society, a lot of. Uh, I, I'm going to reframe the, my. How I. Uh, I'm going to reframe the discussion. Accessibility to me is a resource. It is a resource. Just like food, water, shelter, and housing. But we have no say, disabled persons have no say in how re that resource is distributed at all. In the country's political system, we only have one senator. Who is meant to be one senator, right? So I'm going to give face to JKM and basically, okay, fine, we have seven categories of disabled persons in Asia. Um, Sight, hearing, and whatever. <laughs> but because of the country's law, someone with a mental disability, a mental disorder, cannot be appointed senator. Neither can they run for elected office. So you listening to me right now, you need to okay, that makes a lot of sense. Who knows his shit? Sorry, that's my one swear word for today. PG <laughs> the So, but I cannot run for office. And how are resources distributed through the political process? But accessibility, we have no one in policy planning or decision making roles. So how do we, how do disabled persons influence that distribution of that very much needed resource, which is accessibility, which would provide the social model of accessibility to people of us? Okay, so what's next? How much time do you have actually? Five minutes. Okay. Sorry, I had too much coffee, so I'm bouncing all over the place. So, what's next? Break the cycle. What cycle? The inaccessibility cycle. Chicken and egg, ah, basically, right? Break this cycle. How can you break this cycle? If you work in Asia, put up an equal opportunity, employment opportunity policy, prioritize disabled persons. Look to see how you can. Accommodate, make reasonable accommodations in the workplace. We're not talking just about wellness, 
talking about enabling disabled persons. Be Japanese. Yeah, I have a Chinese organization. Yes, so I wanted to get that. So, how do you be? Three simple ways to be good allies. Disabled is not a bad word. It's not. However, having said that, there are some persons who do not wish to identify as disabled. I know quite a few of my peers in my fellow advocacy who are living with mental disorders themselves do not identify as disabled. And that's fine. That's totally fine. Because why? That's also being inclusive. How do you wish to be identified? They then he, he, she, her, same thing. A lot of us people to be called disabled just because that uh, and issue using other terms is, like I said earlier. Does that need to use other terms come from a place of you being uncomfortable with being uh, people with being disabled? Or is it does it lead more access? Does it lead less stigma? I personally do not want to be involved in discussions around semantics because it wastes my time. Because I would rather work on removing barriers. Those who want to discuss the semantics, the word that we want to use, please go ahead and do it. Right? But I am really quite disabled because it removes the burden of the stigma for me, it places the responsibility of enabling disabled persons on society. There is a difference between language and disability. But, um, side note, Shah is responsible for all these things. When uh, health conditions are met, it's inaccessible now. So, okay, okay. so I'm going to go back to the panel. So, talking about access and talking about representation. Um, the state is not incentivized to increase access. That's the problem. Number three, nothing about us without us. Now, this has been updated to nothing about us on stop. Nothing without us. So don't talk to us just about disability. Talk to us about living wage. Talk to us about distribution protection. Talk to us about climate change. Involve us in everything that we do. Because we are still part of this planet. Thank you very much. You can follow us on Twitter. I don't swear on that account. You can follow me on my personal account. There's a lot of swearing. As we must be on Twitter. Um, and I want to thank the organizers as well. Uh, before I end, I want to say this. Uh, again, this is not this is not the yeah? the organi when we uh, when organizers first reach out to us and ask, uh, could you uh, attend this event instead? I'm sure no problem. Uh, but how is this good? This is the first time that the organizers have been asked how accessible is the event. So if you are going back to your places and are going to um, walk. Even if you're not going to be more disabled persons, be more accessible. Lah, so long as you're doing something, you can follow us on Twitter. We have way more tips there. Uh, we can talk to you later on. Or anybody. So that whole road, that whole road there, that's my next step on Twitter. Okay. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. to take over, but after Hasbi spoke about uh, disability sensitization, it kind of touched my heart, and I think I should put myself up there. <laughs> so, um, um, thank you for doing this, Hasbi. I think we really need this um, in Malaysia, especially. And I have not always been on a wheelchair. Um, I just got on a wheelchair like four years back. Um, so um, being on a wheelchair took a lot of my freedom away. Um, so I was depressed. I was alone. I uh, I lost like ten times of my confidence. And putting myself back out there was really difficult, you know. 
Um, and then um, I, I challenged myself, came up, and um, with some support, of course, um, I got the achievement award, Alhamdulillah. I was always like for that. And one good thing about achieving, they were very accommodating to my request, especially during the pandemic times we were there. And um, being in the UK during the pandemic time in our wheelchair, it was very challenging. Super challenging, and we can't bring any of our uh, family members back home. So what um, Chiumin did was um, they allowed me to have extra funds. I actually had to prove to them that I need this extra funds. And also they uh, provided care, um, a care service when I was coming up there. So these kind of services, we can't dream to have in Malaysia. It's so very difficult. I went around UK just with, with wheelchair from city to city, London, Manchester, Scotland. It's like, and I had no, no problem just because it was accessible. I know UK has a lot more to go for, for the accessibility. There's a lot of staircases, like their subs are not uh, very accessible. <laughs> there is some things. But once I came back to Malaysia, because my freedom was taken away, I was really depressed. For me, I'm working in a uh, healthcare sector, Ministry of Health sector. To actually accommodate a simple parking for me, despite working with them for 10 years, took so many red tapes. I had to go back to them again and again to prove that I need the parking. What the hell? Doesn't this <laughs> tell you that I need a parking nearby? So all these things make our life super difficult. But despite that, I feel like I should put myself out there and this is what I can do in my capacity. So I feel like from your capacity, um, try and be more accessible in any ways. If you have businesses, cafes, make the spaces more, you know, um, spacious. Like, just not even this space wasn't as spacious, but yeah, I thought it would be, I could have told them, but they immediately cleared up for me. Thank you. So, Chimining Committee have been quite, um, you know, uh, accommodative, and I think I have made y'all more sensitive to this, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, and um, like the disabled uh, toilet was not available in this level. We have to go all the way down. If I go to shopping complexes, the disabled toilet will be used by somebody else's. These little, little things are things that we can do in our own capacity to change the narrative in Malaysia. So um, although we can't do it like in a parliamentary level, if you can like voice it out in social media, that will be best. I tried my best to voice it out last year. It reached Ras and Baratsi. Um, I hope something can be done, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm just doing what I can in my own capacity. So in your own capacity, please, um, you know, um, try and be more inclusive because we are humans. Like he said, don't just talk to us about our disability. Come on, people come, to, come up to me and they ask me, oh, why are you in this chair? I'm so tired of telling people I'm in this chair because of this. So tired. Yeah. Okay? Uh, Treat us like normal people. Uh. And in the UK, it's like, it's they, they, they if they give like if they are not accessible then they are so apologetic. It's already in their law la, that uh, you know um, you have to be accessible. There's um, they have disability officers in each of their department to actually accommodate for this. So this is something you can do if you are in a corporate uh, world or in your own department. You can start having like disability officers who can tend to their needs and eventually. Uh, uh, we have this 1% employment um, rule in Malaysia to actually take in at least 1% of your population in, but I don't think that's working at all. No, it's just in the paper. Four ministries. Sorry? Only four ministries are fulfilled, and if you remove the number of disabled um, police, uh, police officers and army officers, only one ministry has fulfilled. And there is no data on whether these were hired as disabled persons or they became hired, uh, they became disabled on the job. And no, yeah, yeah, they, they're not hiring disabled persons. I mean, just, I'm telling you now, they're not hiring. The policy has been around since 1998, rolled out by Secular in 2008. And Ismail Sabri made it a KPI for all ministries last year. We've been asking for data, have you fulfilled, have you fulfilled? Even Siva Kumar, the Human Resources Minister, who said discrimination protections are not necessary. His ministry has not fulfilled the 1% quota. So this is the part where, I mean, I like to go up and smile and 
be nice and talk to people and not project so much angst, but it's difficult. It is extremely difficult. And like I said, I am with privilege that I don't look disabled. I actually wanted people to know that I'm disabled. That's why I wanted red or yellow colored hearing aids. And that's why I actually put them on in front of you guys. Because I want people to get used to deeply interacting with disabled persons. Like a long time ago, right? Glasses, eh? Can I wear glasses? If I were to take your glasses away from you, would you consider yourself disabled? If you had to go to face stigma to see an optometrist, if you face discrimination by wearing glasses, would you consider yourself disabled? That is disability, not the actual impairment in your eye. And that's the problem, no? We're not being involved. Okay, so let me just end. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm bouncing off the walls. Uh, Jerry actually asked me, what are the problems we face when getting people to sign up for disability assistance? I think this is my conjecture. Sorry, this is my conjecture. We are extremely uncomfortable in discussions about our mentality and frailty of our bodies. Extremely uncomfortable. And this kind of denial, this kind of unwillingness, expresses itself in many ways. I know it's not a proper term, not a proper medical term, but, but the five stages of grief, anger, denial, these are all expressions of how people look and interact with disabled persons. And I think that has a lot to do with our societal incentive. We value disabled persons only as a prop, as code for being happy. So you fill us up in a hall and people applaud, yay, okay, you, like you. Sorry, I'm not projecting. I, I hope I'm not projecting a lot of things. Um, but what we want? People are talking about us, for us. We're not actually warning us. It's frustrating. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, so my conclusion is, until um, Malaysia is like at least fifty percent accessible, we will need help. We it's difficult for us to ask help. So. Be accessible in your own capacity where you can start now. Thank you very much. Okay, because this can happen to you one day too. Yeah. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa and Hasley, for sharing like what disability sensitization, like moving forward. This is the future of comfort. You are not, not disabled, you are just not yet disabled. And if it's not accessible, it is gonna affect all of us. And looking forward. Um, to the future means accommodating and like making space for everyone as well. Thank you so much for that session, just now. We're going to move into our next session. Allow me to introduce um, Nisa, um, our um, second Nisa session. Nisa. Nisa is a mental health practitioner, where she trains communities and organizations in psychological class um, eight and mental health psychosocial support, and provides psychotherapy to individuals and groups. Her modalities are in trauma-focused therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and mindfulness. Lisa is also a humanitarian strategist with over 13 years of experience in strategic partnerships and community development. She multiplied funding and partnerships and secured grants from established institutions for United Nations, Red Cross, the Crescent Movement, and for various non-profit organizations in Malaysia internationally. So let's join me and welcome Lisa. <laughs> everyone still have the energy to listen and I'm very touched with the sharing my hands in my shop because it's very close to me um, because my son is autistic, he's 10. Um, so I know, I mean I, I can only see and I, but I feel as a support system in providing assistance to um, people not losing me. So basically today we're going to talk about psychosocial support um, that not just people, um, you know, not just sort of people need but everybody needs. So we got to do introduction to psychological therapy. And I must say, I know that a lot of uh, audience today are mental health practitioners, so you may cut some of these things. Uh, this may serve as a reminder. And of course, you can also introduce to some of your communities or um, colleagues who also mental health um, oh, Next. Sorry. So we have a fun test. Pick up your phone. This is a time where it's OK. To take out your phone. Um, 
really simple, very, very simple test exam. Um, whoever scored 100, you get a recognition. Good job. <laughs> Okay, number one question, very, very simple. Got it, got it? Do you see it? So we've got 27 answer. The goal in providing the activity is short term and long term, which is to provide an environment of safety, connectedness, and empowerment. Betul atau salah? True or false? Short term saja. Yeah. Boleh okay. answer. So we're gonna wait a little bit. Okay. Everyone got it? Okay, next question. Adults and children have similar reaction to crisis. Betul atau salah? We have a child expert here also. Betul atau salah? True answer. True answer. Majority is going to false. Okay, next slide. Right, this is very important. Only mental health professionals can provide PFA. Is it true or false? Yeah, but yeah. Okay, one true. Okay, PFA is psychological testing. What we're gonna learn today. So this is a free assessment. So you can just uh, try and. How can we get Okay. So two answered true, and then the majority answered false. Next. Oh, you can draw, okay? Last but not least, components of PFA is look, listen, provide solutions, and follow up. Betul atau salah? It's okay, it's okay, because this is a pre-assessment. Hopefully later, after you learn a very brief PFA, you get a better outlook. Okay, true, 17, 18, false, 15. Mm -hmm. I like this conversation, right? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So remember, remember your answer, and later on, if it's wrong, we get we get we get corrected. Okay. Okay. Now let's go down to the why we have to learn the PFA. So we're gonna use the method of one has one and four words. All the reason why you have to do and how you're gonna do it. So why are we learning about PFA? So a lot of our panels just now talk about we need to do something to prevent. And PFA is one of the most to prevent things from getting worse. So we do have psychiatrists, doctors here, and they are, you know, because of COVID, they are they 
because of COVID, it increased the number of people with mental illnesses. And we don't have as much psychiatrists, psychologists, and counselors in the organization. Therefore, one of the ways to prevent this is through psychological testing. This is just in 1st November, just a few days ago. So Dr. Dalha um, announced that there's 1,350 reports on suicide. And this is from the mind as a doctor, my reader, as a doctor. So you imagine from these people, you know that there are a number of people, a huge number of people among us have risk towards suicide. What are we going to do about it, right? And the aim for PFA is actually to embed PFA practitioner amongst us. Hopefully, one PFA practitioner, one PFA uh, provider in every house, in every workspace that you have, in every unit, someone that can notice the signs and then do something about it. So we want to lesser the number of patients going to see my lord, the psychiatrist, or mental practitioner, or um, psychologists out there, because most of the things we can be, we can prevent it, it can be prevented. So that's the one, we have to do it. Um, next, I keep on forgetting this. Okay, so just now, the quiz, right? So it caters actually short term and long term. So short term, we want to restore the feeling of safe, calm, uh, connectedness and hopeful. Long term, decrease the mental health impact on survivors. We don't want to call people victims, we want to call people survivors because we want to install, instill uh, resilience inside every one of us here. So basically, when it comes to short imagine you just lost someone that you love. Sometimes you just need someone to talk to, but you don't have people to talk to because everybody's stressed in the house, everybody's stressed in the office, so who do you want to talk to? When someone's able to recognize the signs and able to know Listen well and know what to say, the question to us, and how to leave that. Actually, you lessen the bigger impact you can have to the person. As long as someone recognizes that there's a need to connect. So it's about connectivity. It's about providing that social support. Because more often than not, it's not medication. It's not social media. That's all. It's about someone who asks you, how are you doing? Are you okay? And it's okay. It's okay not to be okay. It's just you need someone to feel that and go through the motion with you. So, the quiz also, huh? remember? So, who can provide PFA? So, similar to physical uh, aid, like first aid, anyone who are trained PFA can actually perform PFA. You don't need to be a counselor, psychologist, you don't need to take psychiatry or how long? Seven years, eight years? You don't need to, to take that. So, as long as you are trained in PFA, you can. Um, provide effective PFA. So healthcare workers, frontline workers, firefighters, police, soldiers, anyone who want to help others, this is an essential skill that I would recommend everybody to learn. So remember, you don't need to be a mental health practitioner. Okay? So who can receive this? Um, survivors of any crisis, someone who lost their cat, someone who lost someone they love, break up, uh, someone you're going to mind on the boss, you know, lost a job, whoever. But remember, it's not necessary for everyone. So you can't force someone. When you see someone, I think you have a problem. Tell me, I'm a PFA We don't do that. Okay, we don't do that. So you need to recognize, you need to offer. Um, uh, do you need, you, you want to talk about something and see that your mood is different? I'm here to talk, but you can't force people. To talk to you, but you have to offer, okay, I'm here. Um, when you're ready, you can reach out to me. But we don't force people. Okay. Okay, now we go to the most interesting part. What is it about, right? Psychological testing. So it's the first line of action, and it's immediate intervention in the in the form of humane, supportive, and practical assistance to people who recently suffered stresses. To put it simply, to provide two components psychological support and social support. You be there, you ask them what they need, you listen to them and you link them. And then we have to know that this is very important because people react abnormally in abnormal situations. Because it's not normal, you can't assume someone to smile when the boss just shouted to them, right? So we expect them to feel something because we are human. But in 
terms of reaction to crisis, there are differences between adults as well as children. For adults, it's normal to feel shock, numb, disoriented, or confused, to feel anxiety, to feel panic, anger, feeling on the edge, withdrawn. Some will go to um, things that make them addicted, easily social media. Who's addicted to social media? Mm. <laughs> TikTok. So addiction is a sign of, you know, you're coping, you're trying to cope. It may not be a healthy coping mechanism. Some people take uh, drugs, they go to food, um, watch something. Um, yeah. Insomnia, have trouble sleeping, and etc. So they, they, they are basically a lot of signs um, and normal reaction to crisis. But for children, it's a little different. Um, they don't have the vocabulary, the perkataan yang tepat to express uh, to people around them. So what they do is they cry. So they are more clingy. Um, you can see mild, milestone uh, for a repression. They don't like to play anymore. They don't like to. They don't know how to socialize anymore. Uh, no interest. They get uh, startled a lot. So you know that when a kid, they are not behaving normally. They get you know, the kajak cepat, like you datang, tiba you pegang, there must be something happening. Uh, some kids are much more numb, they isolate themselves. The signs are different, sometimes maybe similar. If it's similar, maybe it's ACEs. So childhood adverse, uh, adverse childhood experiences where from the start, you learn that these are the ways that works for me to show you, to save myself, uh, so you carry it towards adulthood. But more often than not, the signs are different. So remember, the signs are different. So where, now where we can conduct PFA? In most cases, uh, for example, I was with Red Cross Red Crescent before, we go on the ground um, in disaster places, crisis places, evacuation, uh, evacuation center to provide psychological first aid. Because more often than not, they don't need a therapy. They need someone to talk to, very brief, very short, and they have the capacity to just remind it, hey, actually, this is bad, but I can handle this. They just need someone to go into that. Um, in vehicle, ambulance, in community, but the essence is when we want to provide PFA, we want to ensure that it's conducted in a safe space. So we bring them to a quiet space so you don't allow us suddenly, like, you know, for example, like Sean, you can see, you know, you're so sad. So I just, there and there, ask you a lot of these questions, right? So it's, so appropriate. So we need to find a safe space to conduct PFA. Be more sensitive, uh, taking care of uh, someone's dignity, cultural sensitivity, and all that. Um, basically, it can be conducted anywhere. But you use your judgment to conduct it at a better spot. Okay, we good so far? All right. So how are we going to do PFA? So these are the principles of PFA. Uh, look, listen, and link. That's three L. So usually when I conduct PFA for kids, they're gonna be like some dance movement. You wanna do it here? <laughs> Maybe not. So look like this. So everyone move your hand. Look. Okay, look. You look around, you observe. What are the signs? Who should I prioritize? Um, what are the things sometimes you see someone, you look at their emotion, you look at their cognitive, sometimes they are not focused, disoriented, uh, you look at their behavior, withdrawn, or maybe there's anger movement, you look at their physical, maybe sometimes number of like makan, to be sensitive. We look at all the signs and we prioritize. So look, listen, listen, so we listen to them. Listen is not just verbal, it's also non verbal. So when you want to talk to someone, you look at them and you know, you know your physical body speaks more than what you say. So you look at, are they comfortable with you? Um, do you can you engage trust? Is there interest? So it, it takes time to read all these signs, but we want to encompass the non verbal and verbal cues, and then we do active listening. So how do we do active listening? Active listening is not just listen to what someone is saying. But actually reflect back on what they actually see. So you want to show that you are listening to someone when they say that actually I'm very sad because my cat just died and I can't focus. 
work because I sleep in my calendar. For example, to show that you're listening to someone, what do you do? Oh, Christiana, it's not like that. You pick up what they say. Oh my god, I can't imagine losing a cat. I used to have cats before and they hurt me so much, you must be in pain. So they know that you're actually active in listening to them. You respond to what they say rather than what you want to say. Because some people be like, oh, cat my tea, then you buy a new cat, now. that's it. So you don't want to do that. So you want to actively listen, like truly listen, because you want to put yourself in the position of the person that you're trying to help. Um, of course, in a full PFA, so usually I conduct this training half day, usually. So imagine 20 minutes, I don't know. Try to press the here and there. So we have uh, specific um, techniques that we use to listen, active listening, uh, which you will learn in a full module. And lastly is link. Link up. So look, look listen, and link. Like that. Okay. So link is also very important because you don't want to listen, you don't want to look and listen and then not referring them to help the daily. Um, more often than not, people don't need something extra to help them. Sometimes it's within them. Things have happened and then you just remind them that, hey, um, you've got it within you. And then you, perhaps you can try, let's say if you want to talk to your childhood friend, you go and call them. So you remind them their internet resources, as well as their social support around them, or the community within them. Then only you ask them, it sounded like, you know, you need, you may need extra help. Am I right? If it's right, would you like me to recommend a few counselors, psychologists, or psychiatrists? Then only you refer. And this bit is the action bit where they can look inside internally and externally. Very good so far. So, three L, yeah? Okay, and last but not least, this is a very um, brief video, but it encompasses everything that I just shared. So, I hope you. If A is aimed to help people cope with the emotional aftermath of a crisis, build resilience, and ease their recovery to normalcy. Why do PFA? People do better following a crisis if they feel safe, connected to others, calm and cooperative, have access to social, physical, and emotional support, and regain a sense of control by being able to help themselves. You don't have to be a mental health professional to do a PFA, as everyone can be trained in PFA. We can administer PFA by preparing, looking, listening, and linking, which will be further elaborated in this video. Before entering a crisis site, do check that it is safe to enter. Do not enter the site if it is deemed unsafe. Remember the guidelines for administering PFA. Use appropriate body language. Maintain eye contact. Use the appropriate style of communication. Ask if they need a person of the same gender. Beware of their dietary requirements. Do not impose your own religious beliefs. When looking around the crisis site, identify people who need medical attention or people who are distressed. When they are injured, attend to their medical needs first. For people who are distressed, you can help by administering PFA. After identifying the distressed person, we can proceed to help them. Remember, when approaching the individual, introduce yourself and ask if you can help and address their needs. Do not pressure them to talk if they do not want to. After listening, we can help.
loved ones, or any social services that can be transmitted in the We can offer a follow-up link and update if there are any new information available. When editing your assistance, remember to keep in mind that PFA is a brief intervention. Right. So that's basically the conclusion. Um, PFA, there's a number of specific ideas that we can learn in the full uh, workshop, but you've got the gist. Um, is there any question? Hi, uh, I am Julie. Uh, I'm the I'm the office editor of the room. Uh, I have a question about how do you uh, navigate if you are addressing someone you might not know is on this day. Okay, or someone who is on this day. But yeah, uh, uh, either you are administering the FA to someone on the day, or you are the obviously person who is administering. Yeah, okay. How do you navigate that and right now? Yeah, I apply the principles or uh, uh, components. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very good question. So PFA, thank you. So because PFA is not um, conducted, applied by mental health practitioner nor healthcare worker, so we do have limitation. So with this, we know that we are not going to care and keep where we are super meant to do. So we know our limitation um, for cases with people with uh, different needs. We will highlight, we will recognize, okay, this person needs a special, special need. Therefore, we can refer them straight away if we don't have capacity. But in most cases, we would know some of the signs before we uh, refer them to others. I hope that answers. So, do you want to elevate? Uh, uh, I, uh, for context, I, um, okay, so I have been, uh, okay, so for, uh, I have been diagnosed as an adult, um, meaning like I'm late diagnosed, obviously, but uh, that is also because when I try to assess healthcare professionals, they don't see or they don't think that I quote unquote look autistic enough for them and that really uh, I took a brand of that and you know with uh, it comes with a lot of because of barriers uh, navigating because I didn't have support I wasn't recognized as autistic so um I feel like uh, yeah I, that's my concern that because you can't really know who is autistic or not. So um, how do you feel that gap? Or, yeah. I'm so sorry that you did not get the assistance that you needed. Um, um, again, I want to highlight on this also. Ideally, we want all mental health practitioners to know the signs. Um, that's why we work very closely with organizations uh, in specific capacity, for example, Malaysian right person on the ground, they are uh, the stakeholders that we work very closely with. So we kind of know uh, the target um, community that we're helping. So we know we know more about the signs. But in some cases, yeah, more often than not, volunteers, practitioners may not know enough because they are not a mental health uh, practitioner, they are not professionals. Therefore, we provide them, okay, if you see certain things that you really cannot um, provide assistance, we really link them. To professionals. So, referral mapping is super important in the work of PFA because we don't want to keep them hanging knowing that we can't provide all this, you know, we can't provide everything. Um, so, therefore, it's a, it's a community kind of work to ensure that everybody gets assistance that they need. Yeah. So, because this is the first wave, uh, actually, there's a pyramid. Um, the top would be uh, specialized mental health uh, intervention, like psychiatry, um, and then we go to Legal psychologist and counselor, and then we go further down into uh, focus intervention like people with certain uh, mental health condition, people with family issue or work issue and whatnot. So we have focus, and then at the bottom is basic psychosocial support. So basic psychosocial support is 
all that um, you know everyone can do it. Um, yeah, but then we, we would know what are the demarcations of what we can offer and what we can't um, offer. So I hope that helps. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, my question is, as before, how can we get like for Okay, thank you. Uh, so there's many uh, mental health provider and humanitarian, as well as corporate, that provides um, mental health BFA certification. Um, can I like, plug in? <laughs> So, like for me, I'm a certified uh, PSA trainer from the National Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent. So I can do train. I, I do train corporation companies on elaborated PFA. So there's basic, intermediary, and advanced PFA. Um, but there are a lot of others out there that offers um, PFA training as well. There's two types: PFA uh, as well as mental health um, services. So two, you may see two. So do connect me uh, on LinkedIn, and that's my email if you need more information. Uh, the certification that they have, then, um, like, I'm like, I'm not going to like expiry because I think that's what we're going to have to say. I'm not going to get that one because 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 I'm not uh, for PFA, there is no expiry, especially when the if it's for basic, yeah. So there's no ex um, expiry. Okay. Um, yeah. For more information, please uh, connect to me. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you get something. Uh, Thank you so much, Nizam. In the middle of time, in the of everyone's hours, I know that um, you've been saying on the way behind us. Well, but I want to, um, I want to take one minute of your time, okay, one more minute. I want to first start by saying thank you for keeping with our agenda and for continuing to participate in the sessions that we had. We really wanted to provide a lot of value to you for being here, and that's why we packed in these info sessions as well on top of our esteemed uh, panel of speakers. But we're really getting started, and so I'm, in this one minute, I just want to reflect on what brought us here today and what you can look forward to after this event. So I did my GT year during the pandemic and coming back from the UK with this broader perspective and having survived the pandemic, I recognize that so much has changed for better or for worse in how we practice health and how we think about health, but so much more needs to change in how we think about health and how we practice health. And so when my, my GT friends and I came together uh, to run this first ever health networking event by the Shipping Alumni in Malaysia called Can Help Her. Our intention was not to create an event per se. It was to create a community. And that's why the event is called Help Her. Because we want this to be a hub, a community, that continues on beyond today's event. And therefore, after today's event, please look out for a survey that we'll be sending out to all of you. And Tell us what other topics they are interested to um, hear about. Tell us how you would like to be continue to be engaged in this community because we really want to continue these conversations with you about health and how we can continue to craft the future of health together. So I'll close there. You've been sitting and listening for a long time. Now you can do your walking and your uh, talking. And lots of food for thought here, and now you can get actual food outside there. So thank you everyone so much for your support to the community, and we look forward to seeing you in future activities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.